Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Business Data User Conference. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Vanessa Higgins, and I'm the Director of Training for the UK Data Service. So my colleagues and I within the UK Data Service have been running these user conferences for many years for different types of data, so health data, census data, and various others. But this is the first conference that we've held for business data. So really excited to be hosting it today. And it's the first one that highlights the secure data that's accessed via the UK Data Service Secure Lab and the ONS Secure Research Service. So really, really happy to be delivering this conference in collaboration with ONS today. Just before I hand over to Louise Corti from ONS to say a few words, I just want to say a little bit about the UK Data Service Secure Lab because we are celebrating its 10th year this year. And the Secure Lab was the very first service in the UK to make accessing detailed microdata possible remotely. So that's from your own um, office. So which, of course, the ONS Secure Research Service also does that now too. And as we've all experienced recently, remote access has become even more important to the research community during the pandemic. So uh, prior to the remote access, researchers had to travel long distances in order to access the data in safe rooms. So it's wonderful that the Secure Lab and the Secure Research Service at ONS supply this amazing service for researchers and researchers wouldn't be able to do the amazing research if it wasn't for these two services. And you can find out more about becoming an accredited researcher and gaining access to the data sets in the lunchtime brown bag session. So please do attend that if you want to find out more. So that's all I wanted to say. So I'll hand you over to Louise Corti from ONS to say a few words now. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Thank you. Um, I'm Louise Corti. I'm Head of Insights Development and Impact at the Secure Research Service. Um, and I joined in January, um, actually from the UK Data Service. I worked alongside Vanessa as a, one of the directors for 20 years. So really happy to be building on today's fruitful collaboration going forward. Um, it is very exciting. And we're absolutely delighted with the huge interest in our data. Um, we have lots of users, we have lots of projects going on the whole time, but having 300 people signed up means we, we really do have a, have a great interest. Um, the event today provides an opportunity to showcase um, what unpublished uh, business and economics data we have available, and also the opportunities for, for their use. Um, and that's under the legal gateways that we have in place to enable that. As Vanessa said, a lunchtime session, if you want to know a bit more about Digital Economy Act and getting your projects accredited so, it's accredited so you can use the data, we have our lunchtime slot where we'll have a short presentation from the Stats Authority and from people from our, our own research environments where um, you, you can hear a little bit and have a chance to ask um, questions yourself. So um, both, as Vanessa says, both ONS and the UK Data Service do host, trust, do host trusted research environments um, that are accredited under the Research Code of Practice and Accreditation under the Digital Economy Act. And that's together with Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. We can provide access to hundreds of survey and um, initiative data um, from central government. Um, and we have thousands. We have around three, three to 4,000 accredited researchers using data um, which, which is which is amazing. So in the morning, you're going to hear from um, ONS colleagues about the uh, transformation program for economic and business statistics, and also some updates from some of our most popular surveys. Um, following that, please do stay for the day because we have um, we have an optional lunchtime slot where you can hear more about getting projects accredited, and then straight after lunch, we have a panel where we're interviewing. Um, people from Bayes and ONS about relationships with, with academia, um, how to facilitate research and um, facilitate the dissemination of research findings as well. And following that, we've got three parallel sessions where we have nine speakers who will talk to us around how they've used data, which is wonderful. Um, and I think just to say, I hope you have a really good day. It's a really exciting agenda. And thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, now I'm going to hand over to uh, Chris Woods, who's going to be sharing, sharing this morning's session. Thanks very much, Louise and Vanessa. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to our morning session. Uh, I'm Chris Woods, and I work at the UK Data Service, where I provide support and training to researchers accessing both business and social survey data sets via our secure lab. I've worked at the UK Data Service for just over seven years now, so I've gained a range of expertise in um, the business data sets and also in supporting researchers in linking 
external business data sets such as FAME to ONS business microdata in the in the our secure lab facility. We also have a range of experience in secure data access and am chair of the Safe Data Access Professionals Group, which is a UK wide network of professionals working in organisations that provide secure access to confidential sources of data, such as the, the business data sets. I'm really pleased to be chairing this morning's session where we're focusing on data collection and primary analysis and where we have our keynote presentation. So in that context, I'm delighted to introduce Donna Leong, who's given the, the keynote today on the Office for National Statistics Economic and Business Statistics Transformation Programme. Donna is the Director of Economics, Economic Statistics Change at ONS, with responsibility for overseeing the Economic Statistics Transformation Programme. Donna also heads up ONS's work on subnational statistics and analysis, levelling up, an experienced senior civil service leader and economist, Donna has previously worked at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Her Majesty's Treasury and the New Zealand Treasury. She has an MSc in Economics from the London School of Economics. So welcome Donna and very much looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thanks very much Chris and thank you for that introduction. Um, I think um, Heather is going to um, be running the slides. Um, so um, we'll just kick off. I think hopefully now you all know who I am. Um, I think we're just going to start off now with a few slides that just show you how um, ONS um, is organised and how um, economic and business statistics transformation fit into um, ONS's wider programme. So next slide, please. So the, the sort of slogan for ONS, the Statistics for the Public Good, um, we have um, four themes in our work. We wish to be radical, uh, you know, um, in our decisions, um, ambitious in what we do. Um, importantly, we want to be inclusive, recognising the importance of counting everyone um, so that everyone counts. Um, and um, sustainable, uh, and this is particularly, uh, I think, um, important given where we are in the middle of a spending review um, through what is obviously will be you know, quite a tough time um, for the public finances. ONUS itself um, is divided into these three different groups, um, including data capability, which is um, I like to think of it as the engine room of how ONS works um, and importantly um, is the um, incubator for the integrated data service, which I'm sure lots of you um, will hopefully be using in the future. Health population and methods, where many of our um, work during the pandemic um, has um, taken place, um, as well as uh, the very successful um, census 2021, um, which hopefully you will hear more about uh, the outcomes of the census um, as we start to work through um, what to actually tell us. And then finally, the group that I work in, Economic, Social, Environmental Statistics, um, we've just recently brought together uh, work on macroeconomic statistics um, and public policy analysis. Um, and my group, Directorate Economic Statistics Exchange is a new directorate within ONS that is focused on really driving forward um, the transformation process of economic statistics. Next slide, please. Right, so I think that's just a repeat, actually. Right. Ooh. So going on to um, the ARIES program. Now, why is it called ARIES? Um, it's uh, stands for Ambitious, Radical, Inclusive Economic Statistics. Um, and um, as it says, that's the program for development for economic statistics from 2021-22. Um, uh, the previous economic statistics transformation program, which had a much less catchy acronym, um, came to conclusion in 2021. Um, so ARIES um, is set to oversee the completion of the economic statistics um, change journey, which began, I think, with the Bean Review and the Johnson Review, among others, um, and hopefully will continue into the future. Okay, 
Next slide, please. Um, and here's our vision. You know, that as experts in our field, we will provide clear, insightful statistics and analysis to inform decision making across the UK in a dynamic, inclusive and sustainable way. Right, next slide, please. So what specifically are we trying to do in terms of economic statistics transformation? I think the first is obviously to make sure that our core economic statistics um, offer, you know, the insights that you need in order to make decisions, including you know, better use of data, um, use of new innovative sources of data like administrative data uh, and improved survey data, but also you know, making available the vast suite of um, uh, different indicators and data to the public through, for example, um, the fast indicators work. Um, we want to be flexible um, to be able to respond to the needs of the day, including the COVID-19 pandemic, but also a big part of my own day job um, is thinking about the levelling up agenda uh, and what can we do in order to help um, decision makers decide what is the best thing that they can do to reduce the level of disparities within the UK. And so there's lots of discussion, for example, over there. There's, there's something like 100 different indicators that you can look at the subnational level. Which ones of those are the ones that really matter in terms of levelling up? And then the last is just to note uh, that obviously, because we are in the middle of a spending review, um, we are um, a bit dependent on you, the users, to tell us what you would like to see next, as well as for the Treasury to agree that that is indeed you know, what is um, most value for money. So um, a lot of what we're doing at the moment is thinking about um, in the context of what can be quite a long-term process in terms of improving statistics, um, what is the general direction of travel um, and what can we do um, when there's obviously a bit of uncertainty um, over um, the, the next three years. So next slide, please. This is just a snapshot of some of the things, projects um, that fall within what we might call the ARIES Programme Board. Um, so within the Programme Board, um, it's chaired by our second permanent secretary um, and the Director General for Data Capability. Um, and I am the senior reporting officer for the programme as a whole. Uh, but you can see that you know there's a there's a very wide range of things that are covered by ARIES including um, perhaps uh, a new labour market survey um, that hopefully will address some of the issues that arose with the labour force survey during the pandemic. Um, BICS and faster indicators, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, the sort of, um, you know, uh, I think what someone called the blue ribbon approach to double deflation, we now I think world leaders in that um, in that area and the incorporation of innovative data sources into measurement of prices. So next slide, please. So we're now going to do a bit of a deep dive into what is happening in terms of business surveys and statistics. And I think while this is focused on business surveys and statistics, there's obviously lots of parallels across um, statistics transformation more generally. So um, we're, um, so hopefully this will give you a good understanding of what is involved um, in making sure that um, our core statistics, um, you know, genuinely reflect you know, what's happening in the economy. So next slide, please. So there's five different key strands I'm going to take you through, including new production systems, because statistics is ultimately a way of taking collecting data and turning it into something that is much more user-friendly, uh, new survey collection methods, exploring the use of administrative data, um, as I mentioned, supporting the levelling up agenda because every statistic has a subnational component. Um, and then finally, what are we doing to make sure that we are responding to your needs? Okay, so what I'll try and do as I go through each one of these is give you an idea of what we're already doing what we're planning to do, and what does the, what do those changes mean for the data 
for respondents and for users. So uh, next slide, please. Right, so new production systems. So this is first strand. Um, so one thing to note is that um, ONS has a, a lot of what we call legacy systems. Um, it's important for efficiency reasons that we move those on to um, much more modern approaches, and in particular developing a new cloud-based platform to enhance our process for producing statistics. Um, and the very first of the short-term business survey, so does retail sales, is moving onto that platform later this year. Some of the more established surveys are a much bigger technological challenge, um, and we aim to develop new systems for those over the next few years. Uh, this is something which is incredibly complicated. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, what does that, what, what should that mean? It should mean that we reduce the risk of error um, we have more flexibility, the content of our surveys, and I think, for example, the BIC survey is a good example of that um, because it was built on the new platform and that gives us a lot of flexibility to add things into that survey and evolve and adapt that survey over time. Um, and also, you know, more streamlined production delivery statistics. Uh, so I will admit that I started, um, you know, my career quite some time ago when you know, Lotus Notes and Lotus 123 was the um, sort of state of the art um, database. Um, you, know, we've, you know, there are still some bits of the organization that are dependent, for example, on Lotus Notes. So um, we definitely, you know, want to make sure that we're moving off those legacy systems and onto much more modernized systems. Uh, next slide, please. We're also undertaking new survey collection methods. So electronic questionnaires, um, uh, thinking about um, in, in particular the challenges for respondents in terms of completing those questionnaires um, and um, uh, creating different ways in which um, respondents can put their information in um, and then collate that information. In particular, I think use of secure electronic file transfers, um, editable, editable PDFs. Um, so we know that often it's it's not a simple task to provide information in a way that um, reflects both, you know, what we think of as a, as a six concept, um, as well as you know what might be for the business, you know, a, um, a, you know, an accounting concept. Uh, next slide, please. So what does it mean if we're using these new digital collection methods? What that means is it's easier for businesses to complete those surveys. It, that means that they're more likely to respond. That gives us more time to look at and, and improve the quality of the data and ultimately better quality statistics but also, as I said before, more flexibility in terms of the questions that we ask. Um, and we can look at, because we are lowering respondent burden, hopefully that means increased sample sizes as well. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, I think one of the um, buzzwords, I think, is administrative data. And, and even in the time that I've been at ONS, which has only been this year, I think um, there's been lots of questions around know, how do we best use admin data um, to supplement um, uh, what we are doing alongside surveys, sources. So admin data can play quite an important role in terms of you know, validating survey data, for example, uh, in the case of the Labour Force survey, um, we we'll, um, have a new online survey, the Labour Market Survey, but we've also got um, admin data through the PAYE data. So that gives us you know, three different sources of information about what's happening in the labour market. Uh, also, it can help us think about you know, what um, our methods are in terms of sampling apportionment. Um, and it can also provide us with new interesting statistics. For example, the use of card data or um, data from um, HMRC um, and in some cases, it can replace survey data, 
um, allowing us to replace existing questions, reducing our sample size, um, and um, allow new questions to be asked uh, that are more suitable to a survey format. Uh, next slide, please. So admin data does give us a different view. It's obviously you know, far greater coverage of businesses um, than surveys. And as I said before, you know, it can allow much more granular breakdown, um, you know, down to the, you know, in, in, the, in the extreme to the personal level. Um, some sources of admin data are produced more rapidly, but actually that's not always true. Um, if we think about, for example, tax data, you know, that's often provided with a lag, um, whereas survey data can capture you know, what's happening at the time. Um, and it isn't always um, possible to find appropriate admin data for some statistics. Um, as I said before, you know, there are differences, for example, between accounting concepts and statistical concepts. Um, but admin data can also provide data that couldn't easily be collected via surveys. So next slide, please. So I think this is very much a hate to move a journey to decide what is, you know, what is the right balance between using admin data and survey data. Um, and I think the best way I think is to see them as very much complementary. Um, there's also important security and disclosure issues, um, which means that we need to be um, careful around data that can identify individuals and therefore restrictions on how we use and produce statistics on that basis. Um, that's obviously got issues for you as users of microdata service um, and then, the, as I said before, the integrated data service um, um, may allow, if, um, you know, um, looking at a variety of admin sources and survey um, sources and bring them together, um, but that does raise the issue around security and disclosure um, and how we can best um, uh, build trust in that service. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to take you through a few examples of how we've used, in particular, corporation tax data to support statistics. Um, so first of all, the new statistical business register, um, understanding divergence between different measures of GDP, um, and um, the annual business survey. So next slide, please. Um, this slide, I, the other thing I mentioned was um, faster indicators. So uh, we are, we, there is a variety of different um, data, which you know, we call real-time indicators. Um, and what, what can we best use that data for? I think, you know, there's a huge, potentially huge amount of information, whether that's, you know, mobility, whether it's ship visits, uh, traffic camera activity. Um, in my previous role, my boss used to watch the traffic camera on the M20 to see what was happening um, at Dover, um, you know, or company's house dis um, dissolution activity. What can we best use that data for? You know, uh, is it how how closely aligned are these statistics to um, what's actually happening in the economy? And I'm pleased to say that that. Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence is undertaking research to help identify what is the predictive power of these real-time indicators and see if we can improve um, their now casting capabilities. Um, for example, you know, that might help us, for example, to produce more timely regional GDP estimates. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, aligning with other data sources. So, um, I talked before about um, using HMRC data. So we already have VAT data, um, which underpins our regional and quarterly GDP and um, estimates. Um, how can we use that data to supplement faster estimates? Um, and can it help us you know, think about you know, new statistics for industries that aren't covered by surveys? Um, tax credits is another source of information, in particular R&D tax credits. I will say, though, that, you know, 
it's obviously really dependent on understanding how the tax system works and how people are using the tax system. Um, so, you know, once again, I think, you know, that sort of question mark of whether app and data, how, how is app and data related to you know, economic activity, which is what we're really trying to get at. Next slide, please. And then I talked about living up, you know, I've always touched upon this. Um, so what are we trying to do? Um, we're trying, ultimately, I think what we would like to do is offer a service to people so that they could go into a region, think about what are they interested, um, whether that's a particular local Um, level of granularity, or even, you know, we've had questions over whether we could look at what was happening on a particular high street. How can we bring together um, data on a consistent basis to allow people to pull out, to effectively build their own geography um, and pull out statistics for the area that they are interested in? Um, that obviously requires us both to collect data on a basis that allows that to happen, to to um, organise that data in a way uh, that can be um, flexibly pulled off the system, as it were, um, and then you know made accessible in a way. Um, so some of you may have seen, you know, the work that OS has been doing on towns and high streets, or um, scholarly telling, or even you know Nomis is an example of how we can make you know the vast array of statistics more accessible on a geographical basis. All right. <laughs> so I think the, the um, you know the next slide was going to talk about the impact on respondents. I mean I've talked before about using e questionnaires and um, editable PDFs and so forth to help reduce the burden on respondents. Um, we also want to make sure that surveys themselves are simple and easy to complete. Um, we we need to. Um, assure respondents that their data will be held securely um, so that um, ultimately, you know, we can, um, you know, increase the respondent rate um, and um, make sure that, you know, our surveys remain representative of the general population. Um, and then the next slide would have talked about our user needs, of which, um, you know, the audience here today is um, very much um, a, a a slice of that. Um, we want to make sure that our statistics are evolving to meet user needs. Um, for example, I've mentioned the BIC survey, um, which delivers now really detailed business statistics faster than any other source. Um, and we are also thinking about um, the digital economy survey, which is a replacement to the e-commerce survey. Um, and hopefully we'll launch that in 2022. Um, so, you know, we've, we've already seen um, our statistics, you know, um, respond to, for example, looking at the impacts of EU exit on trade, um, the recovery from the pandemic, um, all the introduction of new technologies to the UK economy. Um, you know, the, the government, you know, has set out, for example, its priorities in, as well, in the levelling up and net zero space. Um, really interested, I think, you know, to take the opportunity for, to hear from you, our users, um, as to what else we might be thinking about in terms of both, you know, how our core statistics are evolving, um, you know, and are there, is there additional information or statistics that you would find useful as users? So I think what we're going to do now, um, and Heather, I think perhaps you can stop sharing, <laughs> Um, your screen is we're going to enter um, the Q&A section. I think Chris, are you going to are you going to look at um, the questions in the chat? Um, yeah. So got, um, yeah. Yep, and we've got. Uh, I'm going to uh, read out the the questions from the audience now and and give the panel an opportunity to to respond to them. Um, so thanks very much, Donna, for a really interesting presentation. Uh, it's really really great to hear about the the range of work that ONS is doing around this. And, and as we've mentioned, Donna's now joined by four of her colleagues from the Office for National Statistics who will be part of the, the panel. Um, so I'll just let each of them introduce themselves now if we start with John Goff, please. 
Hi, um, good morning everyone. Um, so my name is um, John Goff, um, as mentioned. So um, I'm currently um, working in um, business statistics transformation um, division within ONS. So working very closely with Donna and uh, many of her colleagues uh, in terms of kind of um, helping to kind of um, produce new more sustainable infrastructure. She talked about kind of um, kind of ingress platforms and um, other kind of um, technologies that are quite old. So working with ESG to provide kind of um, new technologies um, going forward um, in that area. Prior to kind of that role, I have worked um, for many years within ESG as well. So I have um, some knowledge of um, the annuals and um, the big survey as well. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, John. And Richard Hayes? Hello, I'm Richard Hayes. I'm responsible for productivity statistics, our research agenda, which covers the ESCO and our relationship with the Turing Institute. And I lead work looking at the future of the system of national accounts with UN, OECD, IMF and other international bodies for the ONS. Great. Thank you, Richard. And Ed Palmer. Uh, good morning, my name is Ed Palmer, uh, Deputy Chief Economist at the ONS and I also lead the Analysis Micro Data and Engagement Division. Thank you. Thanks Ed. And Heather Boville. Hi, thanks. Yes, I'm Heather Boville. I'm um, the Head of Surveys and Economic Indicators within uh, ONS, which is largely the uh, um, analysis and production of the, um, the majority of the business surveys that a lot of people on the call will be, uh, be users of, such as the annual business survey and purchases and Prodcom, as well as the short-term surveys such as retail sales and BICS, which we'll hear more about later. Thanks, Heather. Thank you all. So, so I will move over now to the questions and just read these out for the, the panel to answer. So starting with what outcome variables are you using to measure productivity? Which ones are the posited influences on productivity? And what is, at the moment, the relationship between the two? OK, that sounds like, like one for me. Um, so in our productivity suite, we're currently measuring labour productivity. That's our headline measure. And that is GVA divided by hours worked or um, we also have a, a jobs measure there. So we look at uh, GVA output divided by number of jobs. Alongside that, we measure multi, what we call multi-factor productivity, which is where we try and take account of capital inputs as well as labor inputs in, in the production process to generate, again, GVA. Um, it's worth saying our flash estimates, which are the, sh the fast indicators um, that we produce do use GDP as a proxy for GVA in, in the first instance, but in the main, we use GVA. And then finally, we also publish public service productivity numbers, which look exclusively at the public services, those uh, which are delivered by the public sector and those which are purchased by the, the public sector. And again, we look at that in, in the same type of inputs and outputs relationship way. But because... Um, it is very difficult to get estimates of public sector output in market prices because many of them are delivered without a price. You know, health and education are delivered for free. We look at that in a straight output uh, picture. So we also have intermediate consumption in as an input. Um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Richard. Um, and our second question is, how are you measuring the introduction of artificial intelligence into UK industry? And do you have any reports or data sources on that issue? So I'll take that one. So um, it, it's quite it's quite a good question, actually, and links to what we're going to have a, a more pr a presentation on later. Um, obviously, artificial intelligence is of growing interest and something that um, we understand uh, users uh, want to know about. We're in the process of redeveloping um, our um, e-commerce survey at, at the moment, uh, which would be the survey where we um, we could. Uh, collect um, that kind of information and um, so I will rather than going into the detail of that now we've got um, a presentation coming up after um, shortly after this with Dan Robinson who will talk about the e-commerce redevelopment and what that's looking like at the moment and we can um, we hopefully that will cover the answer to the question but if not we can pick, pick that up afterwards. Just just to add to that um, on our analytical side we're working with you to develop a set of digital um, estimates in line with the, uh, the OECD's new digital supply use 
framework um, that should be coming out later this year and will show what we can manage at the moment but the development of that new survey that Heather's describing the digital economy survey really is absolutely essential for us to be able to fully populate those outputs so hopefully you'll see some progress on that quite soon that's great thanks and uh, yeah we look forward to hearing from Dan then later on on the the e-commerce survey um, so our next question is around the levelling up agenda. So supporting the levelling up agenda sounds like you are focused on government policy. How do you ensure the fullest possible range of subnational estimates are available, including for those who want to question the performance of government? So I think that one's me. Um, so, so I think one, one of the, the nice things about indicators and so forth is that, you know, they are what they are. Um, you know, you know, government may well posit a, a, a particular target. Um, the truth is, is that you know, the metrics that are important for leveling up are probably will move probably in years rather than in months. Um, you know, one of our aims, therefore, is is to make you know a range of data available. Um, so depending on, you know, your view about what is the most important thing for levelling up, hopefully what we're doing in ONS is making that data available to everyone um, so that they can see and judge for themselves, you know, whether, um, you know, what, what the impact of those policies are having. But, uh, you know, my, my personal belief is, is that, uh, you know, a lot of the trends that we see in terms of regional disparities have emerged over decades um, and it will probably take you know, a similar amount of time perhaps to see you know whether some of the issues that the government is thinking about and leveling up you know are really having that impact particularly for example if we think about the importance of early education or health or any of those things you know um, you know the the impact will will, will take time um, but that is precisely, you know, one of the things that we're thinking about as part of the um, subnational data strategy is how do we how do we make sure that we're data is available on a consistent basis so that people can, you know, you know, if they wish to, you know, judge the performance of the government for themselves. Just, just to follow in on that, um, probably one of the big questions for us that we're working through at the moment is where we can redesign some of our data collections to directly collect data at more disaggregated levels and where we're going to need to use methods to apportion data that we collect at slightly higher aggregations to get that picture and it's a question of um, there's a question of efficiency there and there's a question of optimizing the pictures to try and get as much data at as disaggregated level as we can manage whilst retaining relationships and making sure we can understand what that data is saying for us. Um, but there's a lot of methods work to do there. Um, Don has mentioned the ESCO and other, and we're doing more work on that in-house. But if anyone wants to talk to me about um, apportionment methods and these sorts of things, we're always uh, very willing to talk. Great. Thank you, Richard. Um, and a sort of follow up question of, around levelling up as well. So when talking about the business insights and conditions survey in the context of levelling up analysis, is there an alternative to using reporting offices for larger businesses to collect data? Without this subnational analysis on BICS can be, sorry, without this subnational analysis, what well, without this subnational ana analysis on BICS can be inexact. Yep, thank you, I'll take that one. So, um, so VIX is one of the um, services that sits in my area. And also, we, we've got a presentation um, coming up on, on VIX specifically as well, which uh, which um, might go into more detail. But it, um, the questions are really valid. It's one of the challenges we have with VIX because it's collected at reporting office level. We've done a few things already to try and um, produce um, subnational analysis from that. Um, and there's some further um, things planned to, to try and improve the subnational analysis. Um, so we've produced a few articles where we've um, just looked at single site businesses and um, to see how they move and how that compares with the old business movement. Um, and similarly, we've taken businesses that have multiple sites and 
assumed their response um, is is applies across all all sites. So so we've tried tried to look at the difference between those measures. Um, but as the question sort of indicates, that's not um, an exact um, approach. And um, going forward, um, Richard mentioned work we're doing to look at whether there's an improved method of apportionment that we could use, and we can look at that in relation to BICS as well. Um, but we're also considering our, if there are any um, sort of specific questions um, that we could ask of, of multi-site businesses to try and help understand different per performance across their sites. Um, I think with the nature of BICS, because of its timely na nature and pace, um, we wouldn't um, be looking to get quite the robust and quality information that we get from the annual business survey at the regional level. But I'm hopeful there is something that we can do to try and improve the subnational data that comes from BICS. Um, and so uh, yeah, they're the things that we're thinking of at the moment. Um, but but as if welcome ideas as well from people on the call if they've got, got ideas to put forward so we can take that into account when we're, we're considering our options there. Great, thanks. Heather. Chris, can I just add to that? I mean, looking yeah. beyond BICS, uh, we have had for a number of years now within ONS a team that uh, really specialises in data collection from the very largest businesses, which could have a very complicated sort of corporate structure. Uh, and so we do uh, engage with those on a very sort of regular and detailed level just to understand precisely what's going on and make sure that we are apportioning and understanding their economic activity in the correct way. Thank you. Great, thanks, Ed. Um, and now a question well, around the census release. So will you be consulting on redefining towns based on built up areas following the census release? Not sure we've got anyone on the call who can answer that one specifically, but we can certainly take this away um, and um, come back to come come back to um, Richard. Yes. Okay. That's great. Okay. We'll take that away then, Richard, and, and come back to you following the conference. Okay. So the next question is: What different subnational maps of the UK are used for business data, and how do we ensure that these are consistent and ensure that they correspond to the aims of the Leveling Up Agenda? I'll take that one. Um, I, th I think here this is one of the areas where we are trying to engage with stakeholders to identify which levels are, are, are most useful for them. Um, uh, we've obviously transitioned from the pre-existing NUTS classifications to the new um, UTL classifications, um, which brought which basically map onto each other so people will see consistency there um, but I think we, we clearly are, are looking to listen to stakeholders to try to identify which of those are most useful and, and in some areas and for some questions it may not always be a universal picture um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a level one a UTL nuts one aggregation might be quite useful in one area um, might be quite notably less useful in others and so it may be that some data sets we end up presenting in a in a more mix and match approach to try and meet user need whilst obviously always being able to aggregate back up to the, the higher levels um, I think also in here um, there's as Don has suggested this is going to be a long-term piece of work where the art of the possible today we hope to very much improve as we move forward. We have an ambitious spending review bid that we've submitted to Treasury and which we're hoping over the next few years to make some significant progress in this area. Um, so hopefully there'll be more to see soon. Great. Thanks, Richard. Um, and now a question around broadband connectivity levels. So which granular data are collected on broadband connectivity levels and with what frequency? Okay, I'll take that. I'll take that one. So, um, until um, the pre-pandemic, the data were collected annually, um, and it was about whether um, households had um, an internet connection, um, and um, the um, the data in terms of granularity, um, if that's the sort of looking um, sort of subnationally, went down to regional level. Um, the data came from the opinion survey. Um, the the, the the opinion survey um, during the pandemic has, na has naturally um, moved to focus on sort of the pandemic impacts. Um, and also what's happened is the 
mode has changed for that in terms of being collected um, uh, by, on, on sort of online or, dig or digitally. So what we're doing as part of the review of digital statistics is um, um, trying to identify what the user needs are and where they remain um, and the connectivity point will be is one part of that and um, looking at alternative sources if it pre-exists anywhere else um, and we know Ofcom have some data um, and then where there are gaps and um, trying to consider um, where where they'll be filled going forward given the change in mode and content of, of OPN. So, so there is data, um, as I said, pre-pandemic, um, but there, there's an, as a gap because of the change of focus um, of OPN, but we are looking into um, the, that sort of filling, filling that gap and the needs going forward, um, but we don't have um, a definite plan for that. It's, it's a little bit lagged to the commerce development that I talked about earlier. Okay, thanks Heather. Um, just a note, there's lots of thanks from the, the audience for, for the, the responses to the questions. Um, and the question now, will you be working with private sector? Will you be working with the private sector like Data City using company web page scraping and machine learning to define emerging sectors? Shall I take that one? I mean, we, we are already working with a range of private sector uh, data providers at the moment. Uh, Donna mentioned some of those under her, her presentation to our sort of fast indicators suite. But we are working with a number of private sector data providers, also in the sort of financial transactions uh, data area, to understand really at a sort of faster or more granular level what's happening in the economy. And that's been really useful uh, in order to respond rapidly uh, to the centre of government to help them through the last 18 months. But we're also thinking now about, as we emerge from the pandemic, you know, how we can carry on working with those data providers and use the data that they provide us as a complement uh, to all the other things we've been talking about today to help build that better picture of the economy. Um, so certainly any ideas that people have got, uh, and I'll take that one away, uh, would be very welcome, please. You know, there's lots of folk that we're working with already, and we'd really like to carry on doing that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ed. Um, so a question now around the green agenda. So the green agenda is very much a priority, green jobs, green businesses, etc. But it's difficult to know what that might include and how to measure. How is that being approached? Um, I'll, I'll pick this one up. So we recently established a, a new environment division um, within the new economic statistics and environment group that's led by Ian Townsend. Um, and they're working through uh, the set of statistics that they will be generating, analysis that they will be generating. I think uh, this is an area that we are going to be collaborating across our economic and environmental sides quite intensively on, uh, both you know to support COP26, but in the follow-up and afterwards um, to try and get into some of these measures and some of these concepts a bit more. Um, Net Zero and the recent Das Gupta review both give us um, ways of thinking about this, which are a little bit different to some of our traditional frameworks. So um, uh, there will be a lot of activity in this area over the, over the next couple of years. Great. Thank you, Richard. Um, there's some interest, Heather, in the papers you mentioned on the VIX analysis. So just to let the audience know that we will be sharing the, both the slides from Donna's presentation and links to those papers following the, the conference. So you'll be able to, to have a look at those. And if there's any more questions. I, I wondered if I could ask a bit about the, the ONS Data Science Campus and, and its role in, in measuring economic activity. Um, I'm happy to start off, but I think others might want to contribute as well. So, um, so I think the Data Science Campus is organised um, in, you know, uh, probably a unique way for the ONS in the sense that they they tend to first think about um, what are issues and where they can apply their expertise. So obviously, collection of um, you know people with many bigger brains than mine anyway <laughs> to think about um, the application of data science. Um, so they will look for different issues, whether that's, for example, in the levelling up agenda, one of the things that they're looking at is, um, you know, looking at local news sites and whether they can use that to measure sentiment or thinking about um, satellite imagery and just what does that tell us about economic activity. So they're very much a kind of almost a, a kind of, you know, um, experimental sandbox, as it were, for, for pushing out 
boundaries of what you can do with data science and how does that apply to economic activity. Um, but they also have you know, quite a, a sort of important role in terms of supporting work streams like levelling up, for example, um, and um, yeah, and they are, I think they tend to form themselves into what I call squads where they apply themselves to particular issues um, and then work with teams within ONS um, and with our um, academic colleagues, um, ESCO and Turing Institute. Um, so, you know, very much open, I think, to ideas about what, what, what could be done in order to um, help um, push the boundaries of, of what we might consider statistics. Um, so, no, and you, oh, you, you go ahead, Richard. Um, I was just going to say that um, if one looks at, for example, um, the faster indicators, mm -hmm. they're a really nice example of where the data science campus has been able to do some experimental work, which has put us in the position um, that we've then been able to take that and develop that quickly um, uh, and 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 deliver what was a key part of our, our response to COVID in, in effectively double quick time because a lot of that uh, methodological groundwork had been done in a quite experimental space but it also meant it made a quite easy transition to some of those new platforms that Donna was describing earlier um, that it had been done in the right in the right platforms, in the right coding languages, to allow it to be quickly picked up and used, and I think that 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 really has been a key example of where uh, we are now seeing real benefits from the innovation out of the data science campus into into core statistics. Sorry, Ed. I, I'm sorry. I was going to say precisely the same thing on um, the faster indicators, which uh, the campus sort of pioneered a couple of years ago. Uh, and actually, I was, I was looking back over a blog that Data Science Campus produced uh, in 2019, which sort of talked about the value of faster indicators as potentially being able to spot big changes in the economy. And we've certainly had some big changes in the economy, so very present. The other point I wanted to make is that um, one of the key roles of the campus, not only sorts of things that we see published, uh, the work that we've been talking about just now, but also in terms of building capability across government and across the public sector uh, in terms of increasing uh, everyone's data science capabilities. And so anywhere that you're seeing data science sort of growing across all parts of government, not just for measuring the economy, quite often there's a key role there for the data science campus within the ONS in driving that capability. And they've got a really strong role in doing that. And that's one of the reasons it was set up. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Sounds very exciting and innovative and yeah, it's a great development. Okay, so I think if there aren't any any final questions, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Donna for her keynote presentation and to all members of the, the panel for your contributions. Also, thanks to the audience for some, some great questions. I think it's been a really nice question and answer session. So, so thank you all. Um, just to note, um, Chris, in the yep. slides that we'll give you, um, they also include links to all the um, different contacts for ONS business statistics. Um, right. So the strategy there, if people want to follow up on any particular aspect, um, the slide should give you the email details. Right, that's really helpful. Okay, so thank you all. And we'll now move on to our economic and, and business data updates. So we now have economic and business data updates from a range of ONS survey experts. And I'd like to start by introducing Emily Hobson, who will be speaking to us about the Business Insights and Conditions Survey. Um, it should be interesting. I know we've had, had some questions about this already. Emily Hobson is Head of the Business Insights and Conditions Survey at the Office for National Statistics, where she's responsible for fostering its development from a few questions to one of ONS's highest profile economic surveys. Previously, Emily worked as an operational research analyst in the business prices team in the ONS and she graduated from the University of Exeter with a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics. So I'll hand over to you now Emily. Morning everyone, uh, just checking everyone can see my screen. Um, so as mentioned uh, my name is Emily Hobson and I head up uh, the Business Insights and Conditions Survey. 
So just a bit of background on BICS. Uh, the ONS implemented the Business Impact of COVID-19 Survey, otherwise known as BICS, in a matter of weeks, where traditionally the creation of new surveys can take six to 12 months. During a great time of uncertainty, it was essential to provide quick and coherent data on the impact of the pandemic, with data being used in real time by decision makers to identify the strategies needed to respond to the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the UK's economy and society. The voluntary fortnightly business survey has provided qualitative information on turnover, workforce, prices and trade, which has offered further insights around these business dynamics. Final results of each wave of BICs are published in the fortnightly bulletin, Business Insights and the Impact on the UK Economy, and flash headline figures are presented in the weekly Faster Indicators Bulletin. The name Business Impact of COVID-19 Survey was chosen in March 2020 with no understanding of how long the pandemic would last or the impact the data collected from it would have on policymakers, government departments and users. After seeing the success and timeliness of BICS, there are requests from a range of stakeholders to add additional questions surrounding a wide range of topics, including the EU transition period and net zero. This meant that the name of the survey did not reflect all aspects of the questionnaire. So from wave 24, the survey name changed to Business Insights and Condition Survey. As you can see, the acronym of BICS has stayed, but the survey was known for this acronym, and also there's so many acronyms out there already, so why make a new one? As I mentioned just now, BICS is a fortnightly survey, and questions are reviewed and updated as part of each fortnightly wave. We now have final results of 38 waves, which collect responses from businesses during a certain period. The sampling frame used in BICS was designed to achieve, a achieve adequate coverage of the listed industries from the monthly business survey for the first six waves. The monthly business survey collects data on businesses' turnover to use in the monthly ONS gross domestic product estimates. However, agriculture, public administration and defence, public provision of education and health, and finance and insurance are excluded from the survey. The sample size has increased over the waves to improve the coverage of regions and different business sizes to ensure the sample was more representative of all UK businesses. The sample design for Wave 7 of Bix was reviewed and refreshed and went live from mid-June. From Wave 7, the questionnaire went to approximately 24,000 businesses. This sample redesign improved our coverage of smaller sized businesses. In Wave 17, we increased our sample size again to approximately 39,000 businesses. This increase will allow us to further break down the industry data and produce more granular regional data. This is to bet meet the users' needs to better understand the impact of local lockdowns. The BICS results and outputs have received wide coverage from organisations such as the Bank of England, Office for Budget Responsibility and National Institute of Economic and Social Research. Coverage also extends to the news and media where BICS is quoted on a regular basis. While an extensive user consultation about the questionnaire topics was not initially possible due to early time constraints, over the course of different waves of BICS, ONS works closely with policy and analytical leads in government departments to help identify priority topics for new waves of BICS. These have included conversations and user requirements from BASE, the Department of International Trade, HMRC and the devolved administrations. ONS utilizes a microdata approach through the Secure Research Service, where academics and accredited institutions can work on the confidentialized BICS data from all the waves. This has allowed detailed policy questions specific to user needs to be addressed in a secure research environment. The earliest iterations of BICS focused on financial performance during the pandemic, such as the impact on turnover, prices and trade compared to normal circumstances, and operational performance relating to the workforce. For example, whether workforce sizes increased or decreased, and what percentage of staff were working remotely or off sick with coronavirus. Questions covered actual performance in the last two weeks and also expected performance in the next two weeks. New questions are added and refined over time. When the UK government announced the introduction of various schemes and initiatives designed to support businesses and the workforce, Questions were developed to capture uptake and issues at the UK level, as well as uptake for each country within the UK. The question bank of all the bits questions for each wave is publicly available, and with only a two-week window to agree content, design questions, and build, and test the survey before it goes live, we've had to adapt our standard questionnaire design process. 
As the pandemic increased, the need for weighted results has been more critical to provide an estimate of how all businesses have been impacted from the start of the pandemic to date. With weighted results, comparison across waves is feasible, showing how different times during the last 18 months have affected different industries and different sized businesses. Results have three possible weighting methods, weighted by count, turnover or employment. From wave 13 onwards, publications now include weighted results with imputation and a back series from wave 7 to date. In wave, in wave 37, as part of our regular and ongoing quality assessment of our methods, we introduced improved methodology for the weighting of smaller businesses within the big sample when we use employment and turnover to do so. This has, in the main, not affected our previous and findings. We have, though, revised some estimates back to June 2020. BICS has been used for a variety of monthly and quarterly surveys produced by ONS, particularly in the quality assurance stage and assessing impacts between the fortnightly data sets and monthly outputs. The published fortnightly results of BICS are broken down by industry, workforce size and region to incorporate all users' needs. For example, other monthly publications that quote BICS results have included monthly retail sales and construction output. An example of where BICS data matches closely with other sources is the BICS proportion of the furloughed estimates. The figure on the right shows the close match between the BICS proportion furlough estimates against the HMRC official furlough scheme statistics. This is despite the fact BICS is published four days just after the survey closes, while the CGRS figures results are provisional up to four weeks after the time period, which is a feature of the claims deadline, but the HMRC results do offer a wide range of breakdowns, for example, local authority, gender and age. BICS were designed to give an indication of the impact of challenges businesses have faced over the last 18 months, and a time year estimate, estimate than other ONS monthly or quarterly surveys. It is allowed for many different streams of analysis, including longitudinal data analysis following businesses' responses over the weeks, linking to other sources to provide additional insights into businesses such as the labour market, and to help validate other ONS business surveys and provide supplementary evidence. The BICS microdata from waves 1 to 37 can now be accessed through the Secure Research Service. The BICS microdata from each wave are released on a rolling basis in the week following the publication of each wave. Only researchers accredited under the Digital Economy Act are able to access data on the SRS. You can apply for accreditation through the Research Accreditation Service, but you'll need to have relevant academic or work experience and most successfully attend and complete the SAFE research training. Conduct, to conduct analysis with the microdata from the SRS, a project application must be submitted to the, the Research Accreditation Panel. To access the SRS, you must also work for an organisation with an assured, assured organisational connectivity agreement in place. The SRS data is forwarded onto the, for BIX is forwarded onto the UK data service, and all this information on how to apply is available in our fortnightly BIX bulletin. A few notes and caveats of the BIX microdata available on the SRS. The microdata is made confidential and does not disclose information on any specific business. This means no free text responses are included in the data. From wave 17 onwards, the weights are included in the microdata. However, we are in the process of updating and backdating the employment and turnover weights back to wave 7. The main difference between the microdata and the final published results is it does not include the imputes for responding businesses with 250 plus employees. This means there might be slight differences between results created through the microdata on the SRS and the final published BICS results. So just to summarise, no, BICS has provided... You've just got your two minutes left, Emily. <laughs> I'm all, thanks. BICS has provided business-led evidence to support both the regular ongoing traditional monthly and quarterly surveys in uh, quality assurance capacity, but has also enabled more timely estimates of economic activity to form part of the evidence base for high policy pressure decisions. The BICS questionnaire has shown itself to be sustainable over time, and this survey will therefore continue, at least for the short to medium term, therefore continue adapting to the ever-changing economic picture. We continue to explore the potential for further development in BICS and consider what future requirements may be needed by stakeholders. Now open the floor to questions. Thanks very much, Emily. That's really interesting and um, yeah, exciting to see how quickly you were able to respond and, and develop the survey. It's really, really great. Um, so we have some time for, for questions now for Emily, so if you do have any questions then, then please type them in the, the chat.
And I just wondered to start, Emily, if I could ask you a bit about whether there's in, any information in the BICS data set that enable researchers to link the data to other sources of data? So on the SRS um, and in the BICS microdata, there is a variety of um, just basic information around the businesses that respond, whether it's industry, size band, and I think it goes down to four digit standard industrial classification, um, but it also yeah, includes the reporting unit reference, which means it will be allowed to link to other data sources um, such as the IDBR. Yeah, and that's really useful for researchers, isn't it? Being able to, to bring in a whole range of, of business data and, and link them, um, that's great. So we have a, have a question, how might non-government researchers suggest new questions to be included? What's the process for that? Um, to uh, request uh, questions within the BICS um, survey, um, the process is just to drop an email uh, to the BICS um, inbox, which is bics.ons.gov.uk. Um, all question requests are considered um, and we can get in touch whether it is something suitable to include in the survey or not. And can I ask a little bit about the um, the response rate as well, and the impact that that might might have on on the estimate? So, so I know it had slightly lower, well, has a, a relatively low response rate. I just wondered if you've done any analysis looking at um, the the sort of responding and non-responding businesses, and whether there is non-response bias, and and if the weights, uh, I assume the weights are used to kind of correct for that useful just to yeah. bit more about that please no yeah i think you're 100 percent right on that so we might seem to have a fairly low response rate to some other surveys published by the ons but considering that bix is voluntary um it's 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 pretty good i think roughly around averaging between 23 and 25 percent response rate um you're correct in saying um you know the the results are weighted up to be reflective um, of all UK businesses, and this does take into account the businesses that do not respond to the survey. So the results are weighted by two-digit SIC um, and size band. Um, also to elaborate on that, we are in the process of developing standard errors to hopefully measure any kind of um, so sampling. Um, so hopefully towards the um, beginning of the year 2022, we'll be able to publish standard uh, errors for the variables to measure the impact of like maybe low response rate in the sample. Great, thanks Emily. And some of the, the BICS questions refer to expectations compared to normal times of year. Do you have any thoughts about how or if these questions will evolve um, post pandemic when, for example, post pandemic becomes the new normal? Uh, that's a very good question and it's something that we've actually been discussing um, internally uh, for the last couple of months. Um, it, is, it is a hard one to judge because it is also dependent on what businesses think is normal, um, is now the new normal um, hot topic at the moment. So we've, I think we'll, we'll continue with um, using normal expectations uh, for the moment. It's still relevant um, even in possibly like a couple of years. It is just solely dependent on businesses interpretation of normal but VIX is trying to measure uh, the impact of, of challenges. So when there is a challenge it's important to measure against what is considered um, normal whatever time of year that is. Great, thanks Emily. Um, and then a question, can BIC survey information match with other data by ONS, including these secured and controlled ones? Um, so I guess similar to the, the question at the beginning around that. Yeah, so, all, so as, as I mentioned before, um, the microdata on the SRS um, can be linked to other surveys um, with it, with survey data again on, on the SRS just through linking possibly a reporting unit RU reference number. Great, thanks Emily. Um, and yeah, this is a really interesting question actually. Will BIX continue post-pandemic? Will it now feature as a permanent ONS data source? Um, so I mentioned on my last slide, uh, BIX will continue um, in the short to medium term. It has shown itself to be very successful and adaptable, not only collecting data on the pandemic, but on other kind of challenges that have been faced in businesses have faced um, in the last year. So definitely in the short to medium term, yeah. Great, thank you. And a, a nice comment here, congratulations on BIX. <laughs> and have you created um, time series from any of the questions? For example, yep. question reuse between waves. 
Yep, no, 100%. So in our published data set, that also goes out with our fortnightly bulletin. Um, all the data available in there is in a time series format. Great, thanks, Emily. Um, and then just one final question. Are you able to speak to any of the analysis that has been completed using the microdata? So any sort of summaries of, of findings or of any of the analysis that's been undertaken to date? Um, I feel like that's come up. Uh, nothing off the top of my head, um, but more than happy if someone would like to know a bit more detail uh, to get in touch via the BICS uh, email address that I mentioned earlier and is on the front of the slides and I can get back to them. That's great. Okay, so i just say a big thank you to Emily. It's a really useful and, and interesting presentation, so thanks very much for that. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll provide uh, the details as well if people want to have a look at some of the, the analysis that's been undertaken. So thanks again, Emily. Um, and for our second update, we now have um, Daniel Robinson from the Office for National Statistics, who's talking to us about the e-commerce survey. Daniel is head of the Allcom and R&D branch within the Office for National Statistics. He has worked in the ONS for over 20 years and has developed experience in a number of roles covering both business and social surveys, spanning both data collection and results production. Welcome, Dan. Morning. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, as um, mentioned, my name is Dan Robinson, and I head the All Common R and D branch. Um, so I'm going to talk to you this morning very briefly about our e-commerce survey. Um, it's currently being paused, um, and I'll kind of talk about kind of the development work we're doing on e-commerce. Um, so I guess to start a, start a bit with the backstory of e-commerce. So the survey was launched back in um, the year 2000. So it's been a relatively long-standing survey with the ONS. It was launched in sort of um, conjunction with Eurostat. It was a Eurostat-led initiative, and it was kind of launched kind of capturing the e-commerce e and kind of the adoption of ICT technology across the, the EU. Um, so as I mentioned, the purpose was to measure the adoption and use of information and communication technologies within UK with the UK business community. Um, so the definition of e-commerce is... Uh, and the OEC definition is what we follow, and it's any goods or services that were ordered over the internet or other electronic networks, regardless of payment and delivery methods. And I guess to expand on that a little bit, we kind of, historically, we've captured information on kind of web sales in terms of e-commerce, but also sort of through other orders that have been placed through other electronic networks. And I guess more recent technologies, maybe apps and perhaps EPOS technology for electronic point of sale. So that's kind of a definition as to what e-commerce or the e-commerce definition we've aligned to. So our survey design, um, we've got an annual sample or we had an annual sample of around about 11,000 UK businesses and like the majority of all other business surveys in the ONS, we drew a sample from the interdepartmental business register. So this is a business or it's a sampling framework that we use of all UK businesses that are either VAT or PEYE registered and there's over 2 million UK businesses on there that we draw our sample from. Um, a more recent development was that from 2018, the e-commerce questionnaire started to be captured electronically, whereas previously we were using paper questionnaires. Um, and the notable industry exclusions for e-commerce are the financial, agriculture, education, health and social work, public admin and defence, and some arts, entertainment and recreation industries. So we don't cover the whole of the UK economy. Um, Standard sort of techniques are applied to the data once it's collected. So data will undergo validation to improve accuracy. And then in order to elevate our results to the to the population, we will apply standard imputation, outlying and estimation techniques to actually develop some um, meaningful UK representative estimates. Topics covered. So the the since the instead of e-commerce, the, the topics that we've covered have, have varied year on year. Um, it's been a very fluid questionnaire, and given that this is an ever-changing um, space with kind of new technologies being developed, the modules that we've included have changed year on year. So as of the last survey that was actually run in the UK, these are the topics that we actually kind of covered being use of computers to find out whether businesses actually use computers to conduct their business e-commerce in terms of how much trade was generated or sales generated online, um, invoicing, 
um, use of cloud computing services. Obviously, the, the technology that we use to actually store information is changing year on year. We're now moving towards more cloud-based services. Big data analysis, we're trying to find out whether the businesses are purchasing or selling big data in order to develop or improve the services they're um, delivering. Um, ICT specialists and skills, have they been purchasing um, or supplying ICT, ICT specialist knowledge um, as part of their business activity? And some of the topics were around the use of 3D printing technologies and the use of robotics in the, their production processes. And with all of those topics, we're essentially trying to find out whether or not businesses are using these um, these types of kind of technologies and knowledge to actually enhance or develop the products they're delivering as a business. Just to give you some sort of recent insights. Um, so I think since 2015, there's been a general upward trend in the value of e-commerce sales that we've been capturing. I think in 2019, we reached a peak of around about 693 billion in terms of e-commerce sales, um, which was a 15.2 billion increase on the, the previous year. If we were to slice that cake in a slightly different way, looking at kind of industries that have reported e-commerce activity to us, um, it seems to be dominated by two industries primarily being the wholesale and manufacturing industries, which in 2019, the wholesale industry had an estimated value of around about 214.7 billion um, of sales recorded that were generated electronically and the manufacturing industries of 188 billion um, respectively. So two dominant industries that report e-commerce sales to us. So some things which users of the microdata, I guess, should be aware. Obviously, like I've mentioned, we had a, a generally a, a long-standing survey. It's been running close to 20 years. And I think the, the sample coverage has expanded over that time. Um, in 2014, um, we actually started to sample small naught to nine size businesses, whereas previously they'd been excluded. Um, so anybody looking at the data from that period on time, that period of time forward is something to bear in mind. Um, also, when we talk about kind of our total e-commerce sales, I think it's, it's important to mention that historically we've only asked the business to record to us what proportion of their sales um, are generated via, via online sales. And what we've actually done is then constrain that proportion to the industry totals from the ABS. So historically, the e-commerce survey has not been collecting a pounds million value from a business in terms of what their e-commerce activity is. We've constrained to previously published or already collected information on the annual from the annual business survey. Um, also noting the mode of collection changed in 2008 by where we started to adopt electronic methods moving away from the paper questionnaires. Um, and as I mentioned, the topics that we've had on the e-commerce survey have changed in line with Eurostat's requirements. Um, so this may, again, something to bear in mind if you're using the microdata, it may impact on the time series in that particular questions or variables you're interested in may not be there for either long periods of time or there may be breaks and cease. But it was just driven by what the Eurostat requirements were um, at the time of we were capturing the data. Um, like Emily mentioned on the BICS, the microdata for e-commerce can be accessed by the Secure Research Service and the UK Data Service, and that the periods are, are available from 2001 to 2019. So in terms of our development work, so um, the survey paused, so the current survey paused um, in December 2020, so 2019 was the last reference period in the current time series. Uh, myself and my team then entered into a, a discovery phase between January and April by where we kind of met with the stakeholder, external stakeholders, internal stakeholders to reestablish user requirements and policy needs. Um, I think one of the important things is that rather than this being a, a legislative led sort of survey in terms of depicting the questions, we've actually gone back to the stakeholders and the user community to find out what information they want us to capture. And we're trying to deliver a product that kind of specifically meets their needs. So it's a slight deviation from the way we've done things historically. Um, in around May time, we launched a consultation and a blog to try and direct um, so, sort of we were conscious that we we um, met quite extensively with government users. We wanted to widen that reach. So we launched a consultation that went out. There was a mail shot out to 40,000 people um, and there was a blog to direct traffic to that um, consultation just to try and capture people's views and wider needs that would not necessarily have been covered by government. 
um, government users. So in over the summer of this year, my team have been working on turning those requirements into questions. And at the beginning of September, we launched into a cognitive testing stage by where the questions that we've refined with users have now been actually tested with the business community to make sure that we can actually take them forward and roll them out on a questionnaire early next year. As we enter the, the end of the autumn into the winter, we're going to be looking at sort of methods development because one of the key things that we're actually doing now with the survey going forward is collecting a pounds million value in terms of the business's e-commerce sales, moving away from collecting those proportions. So we need to kind of review and implement, review the methods that we have and implement new ones to actually kind of elevate those pounds million results to the population. At the moment, we're currently working on a, the basis of launching or relaunching the survey mid-February. Um, and then the timeline in terms of how things will pan out from there would be we would look to close for a results production round towards the end of September with provisional publication date of maybe the end of December this year, lodging any sort of date, microdata with the SRS um, for the 2021 reference period in January 2023. Um, so I guess key differences between the new and the old surveys. So I think the what we've done in terms of added is we've expanded the survey to collect more data on e-commerce imports in that we've had uh, basic information in terms of e-commerce exports out of the UK. And I think some of the requirements that were coming in was that we need to actually be capturing information on e-commerce activity coming into the UK. So we're going to capture UK imports of e-commerce activity. More international geographic coverage. Again, this is still relatively high level, but I think it's at continents, whereas previously, I believe the breakdowns that we'd only captured in terms of geography were um, UK, EU and rest of the world. So we're now actually going to be trying to identify the continents that we're actually trading with in terms of e-commerce activity. I mentioned about the value of e-commerce sales now being recorded by respondents, whereas previously we recorded proportions only. And two sort of new topics have actually kind of come in. I say two new. ICT security has been re reintroduced, which I think is essentially the same questions that we had with the Eurostat model. But there's also a, a growing interest in digital intermediary platforms. So we have some questions to try and understand if the businesses that are taking part classifies them, class would classify themselves as a digital intermediary platform. Things that we've had to kind of remove or there wasn't a, an identified stakeholder need was that with all of the conversations that we've had with internal stakeholders, external and kind of wider, um, nobody seemed to actually want the breakdown between EDI and web sales. So going forward, we'll just be looking to capture the total only. And some of the topics that we've had to remove because of lack of interest were um, things around kind of invoicing, use of robotics and 3D printing. Well, so next steps. Sorry, okay, Dan, thank you. That's okay. I think I'm on track. So I think next steps for us are digital trade by nature changes rapidly. The survey will continue to evolve and adapt to meet user needs. So I think one of the things which we've we've actually had the benefit of being able to do from the start is to change the modules on e-commerce in line with kind of as things emerge in this space. And I think the that is a requirement and something we're going to be able to meet going forward is that we can kind of engage with the stakeholder community to capture any sort of new needs they have and look to introduce questions onto the e-commerce questionnaire. Um, look to continue to identify needs and explore other potential sources that impact on wider digital measures. I think something that Heather mentioned earlier on was kind of around about the, you know, e-commerce is just one measure of digital activity and we have some that kind of have actually had to cease because of changes to samples and the way data has been collected. So I think we need to kind of continue explore, to explore other sources that may be able to kind of fill the gap from those digital measures that we've lost. And I think one of the more recent developments is that we're looking at the use of credit card data to help build a picture of the digital economy. Um, and then we're going to look to maybe see how perhaps we could dovetail this with e-commerce, initially maybe helping with the quality assurance work on e-commerce primarily. I think that does bring me to the end of my presentation. So happy to take questions. And I think there was one actually kind of... Um, there initially was kind of linked with the artificial intelligence. I think just, just to pick up on that, um, so 
that's probably there's an opportunity within the um, the questionnaire or there's a question on technology and we're actually looking to ask sort of questions to the business community about what types of technology have helped them to develop their business and may, and, and may help them develop it going forward. So there would be an opportunity for them to record artificial intelligence as a, as a software or, or, a, or a method that could help them do that. But I think interestingly, some of the key things that were coming from the stakeholder community were more around more around customer relationship management software, so sort of CRM software and resource planning software and also online accountancy software. So it's not that there wasn't a need for AI, I think, but there just seemed to be more types of software or technologies that were kind of coming through in terms of needing to understand more about than perhaps artificial intelligence initially. So I think that hopefully that answers the artificial intelligence question we had earlier. Yeah, thanks for that, Dan. And it's a really interesting presentation and really nice to hear actually how you've consulted with users and um, you know making changes to the, the survey off the back of that. So I think that's, that's a really nice feature. Um, so we have a question about EDI sales. So could you explain what EDI sales cover? So I think EDI sales would be anything this this kind of non-website based. So if you should make purchases via an app, I mean, we all use apps these days and, you know, lots of kind of websites have their own apps that you can make actual purchases through, which is not deemed through their website, it's through a, a secondary app. Um, and I think also, you know, thinking about how kind of some businesses work, they may kind of order stock automatically Um there may be kind of systems in place where they can monitor stock levels and generate an order automatically via an electronic means that is not physically through a, a website. So it's kind of um, systems around the periphery, such as apps and perhaps more automated electronic forms of ordering. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, can I ask a question about the, the sort of transfer from the paper questionnaire to electronic forms, which you mentioned. And I know I know Donna spoke about a, a sort of overall move to, to electronic um, surveys going forward. Have you seen a like improvement in the data quality off the back of that or? I think one of the things that we benefit from electronically is kind of the, the, the promptness of the response. Yeah. So I think, you know, kind of with, with things, with, with surveys moving to kind of electronic data capture, I think it kind of generates a quicker response. And I think it does kind of build in, allow us to build in kind of more quality assurance and production time. Yeah. Um, I wasn't around with the transition from paper to questionnaire, but it, there may have been some sort of modal effect in terms of the results. Um, but I don't think there was anything significant in terms of kind of impact of quality from moving paper to, to EQ. But obviously, I think that does give us the, the benefit of actually being able to kind of capture data more quickly and kind of perhaps process it and respond in a more prompt manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more timely. Um, comment around automated ordering is quite common in manufacturing supply chains. Um, and I wondered as well, Dad, with the, with the sample, I know some, some sectors were excluded. What was, what's the reason for that in terms of the I think we sample? I think we have a number of um, a number of our ONS surveys don't include all industries um, as as commonplace. I think a large one being the the financial industries, and I think we actually capture information for those industries elsewhere. And I guess with a number of those kind of nuances to those industries, there may be nuances that mean we perhaps shouldn't um, we perhaps shouldn't capture or survey them because their data may be covered elsewhere. So I guess it's trying to perhaps balance kind of um, compliance and, um, you know, overburdening businesses, I guess, in certain industries where perhaps we shouldn't be um, capturing them. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so uh, another question, any data or plan to cover sharing economy or platform economy activity such as Uber and Airbnb? So we've actually got a team uh, separately outside of my team that actually cover, um, I think we do have a publication on the sharing economy. And I think it's perhaps um, there is, there is a, I guess in answer to your question, there is. And I think there's another team kind of within our area who cover the, the sharing economy. So I think perhaps we could actually perhaps link them up with, I can't answer questions specifically. It's outside of my the remit of my team, but perhaps we can link up um, yeah. those teams if they have any questions on the sharing economy yes. to yeah. follow up with. 
yeah that's great we can do that following the conference um, and then a final question is the survey supposed to be representative at the sub industry level for the included sectors so, so i think it's um i think this is representative it can obviously we have a small sample size and i think this is representative as it can be with the small sample size i think if we were and for, and and helpfully part as part of the redevelopment work, we're sticking with the same sample size. So I guess there's not any sort of scope to actually increase sample sizes to give more robustness around some of those estimates. But I guess it's as it's as representative as it can be with the relatively small sample that we have. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, and then one final question, I think we'll just squeeze in. So do you make any adjustments to the estimates of e-commerce to adjust or remove intermediate sales compared with final sales? No, so I think you know the the the, the each return will kind of go will go through a validation process. Um, so a lot of those validations will go unclean so they won't actually be looked at by my team but if, if, if any of the variables in their fail validation um, they will be kind of checked at source with the business and so there, there may be actually some changes to the most um, there may be changes to the micro data when the data is validated at source but in terms of the estimates that kind of fall out of the results production process then we don't make any adjust any adjustments unless we identify perhaps some anomalies that have slipped through in the validation stages and we would go back and again correct the data at source with the respondent um, and then reproduce a set of results so we wouldn't sort of intervene and make adjustments um, so I guess the answer to that is no we wouldn't all changes are done um, with the respondent at source. Great. Thanks, Dan. So I think that brings us to the end of, of Dan's uh, section then. So thanks again, Dan, for your presentation and, um, and to the audience for the questions as well. That was great. And we're moving Thank on you. now to, um, to hear from Jakob Schneebecker, who's talking about the management and expectation survey. Jakob heads the firm level business dynamism and management practices research at the ONS. Before joining ONS, he was a research fellow in economics at the University of Oxford. So welcome, Jakob. Thank you, Chris. All right, um, I am very happy to be here today to talk about um, perhaps one of the lesser well-known uh, ONS business surveys. Um, so I thought I would um, structure this presentation uh, a little bit like uh, a user guide. I, I hope this is going to be most useful to this audience. And I've kept the presentation relatively brief um, to allow uh, for ample time for questions. So um, just by way of introduction, um, what is the Management and Expectations Survey? The Management and Expectations Survey is an ESRC-funded uh, collaboration with uh, academics through the Economic Statistics Center of Excellence. Um, including, uh, just to name a few, Rebecca Riley at KCL, Paul Mason at Nottingham, John Van Wienen at the LSE. Um, and uh, in, it is a voluntary business, business survey of which currently two waves exist, capturing three years of data. So that's um, data covering 2016, 2019, and 2020, um, as well as a smaller mm -hmm precursor survey, the Management Practices Survey, um, which uh, captured manufacturing firms only. The Management and Expectation Survey aims to capture firm level evidence of the use of structured management practices and various correlates to allow to, to study um, the role of management um, in anything from innovation to, to productivity. Um, the survey is collected at the reference unit level and as such is easily linkable um, to other ONS, ONS business surveys. And as, as all the other surveys um, I think discussed uh, on, on this uh, panel of the, of the conference is available through the Secure Research Service uh, for accredited researchers. Um, so a little bit of a roadmap for, for the rest of this brief talk. Um, I'll give you a bit of an overview of the methodology, in particular, what we capture when we say management practices, um, as well as uh, a, a very brief overview of, of response rates um, and other features of the data. I'll then highlight some of the 
features that are new in the latest wave of the management and expectation survey. And finally, I'll conclude with some example user cases um, from our own use as ONS uh, to, give you, to give you an idea of what is possible uh, with this data. All right, um, so first of all, how are management practices uh, captured in the mess? Um, so the management practices score is an aggregate um, of four subcategories of um, structured management practices. Uh, the methodology builds on this earlier wave um, of, of ONS work and even earlier work um, by Nick Bloom, Raphael Sadan, and uh, John Van Wienen. Nick Bloom and, and John Van Wienen are both, are both collaborators in this project as well. Um, so firms are asked about their management practices in, in four key areas. Um, that's key performance indicators, so the extent to which firms um, capture and monitor information about, uh, about uh, in, important performance uh, indicators. Um, the use and communication of targets throughout the organization. Um, the practices related to hiring, firing, training uh, employees. And finally, um, the way that firms react to problems and whether they use, they use those problems to continually improve their processes. Um, so just to put a little bit of, of meat on the bones, so this is a question straight from the questionnaire um, relating to continuous improvement. So we're asking for a specific year, um, what was the most common response to problems faced within the business? Um, was it to resolve the problem but not take further action, to uh, resolve the problem and ensure that it would not happen again, to resolve the problem and put in place a process of continuous improvement, um, to head off similar problems or on no action at all. And um, again, just for, for you as uh, microdata users, the SRS data set, um, Compute scores for each of the categories, but it also contains um, all of the individual answers um, if you are interested in, in um, particular aspects of management practices or want to aggregate them in a, in a different way. Um, and there's docu documentation that uh, explains um, each, of the, of each of the questions in turn. Okay, so sample size and response rates. Um, just, just like PIX, uh, the Management and Expectation Survey is a voluntary business survey. Um, so uh, the response rates are actually, are actually really similar um, to what we've seen on PIX. Um, so response rate during the pandemic, uh, 24%. That's uh, quite a large drop from, from the previous wave uh, for, for pandemic-related reasons. Um, in, uh, the sample size went up because uh, we sampled a larger number of businesses, um, but but the response rate is done somewhat and, and varies, uh, you know, in somewhat predictable ways across regions uh, and industries. I think on this slide, I should perhaps also say a little bit about um, the sampling. So uh, the mess goes out to firms with 10 or more employees um, in uh, 11 Nats 1 regions, so Northern Ireland is excluded, um, in a custom mix of uh, service and, and manufacturing industries. Uh, there's, there's a lot more detail in, in our publications, um, which I will link in the chat um, after the talk. Um, now, to prevent maybe a question that um, Dan and, and uh, Emily got, um, we actually did spend quite a lot of time investigating uh, selective response rates. Um, and the nice thing uh, is that, so to maybe, maybe um, start with the conclusion, we find, we find very little evidence of selective response rates. Um, in, in fact, even for the linked sample, where we can investigate response rates by management practices score in the previous wave. 
Um, and again, there's a lot more about those results in the publications that I will link uh, to at the end. Okay, so what is new in the latest wave um, of, of the mess? Um, I highlight uh, four innovations. Um, the first one uh, might be might be most most important to you is um, we have novel data on pandemic related uh, firm adaptations such as the use of online sales, homeworking, and changes in the supply chains. And um, due to the design of the sample, we are able in the same wave of the survey to capture both a pre-pandemic baseline namely the 2019 responses and the pandemic response, and, and which is, of course, uh, helpful uh, for, for forming comparisons. Um, we've also designed the sample this time around in a way to um, maximize the number of firms we can either link to the previous wave um, for longitudinal study or to the annual business survey for wider productivity research at the firm level. And finally, um, just, just like um, the e-commerce survey, we have moved to an electronic questionnaire, and this allowed us um, not only to improve the response rates relative to um, what the paper-based survey in the pandemic would have been able to achieve, but also to check the data as it was coming in um, and and uh, therefore improve improve data quality. It's two minutes. Okay, so before we open, so two minutes. Right in. Okay, this is excellent, perfect. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me just let me just um, close with a couple of user cases to to showcase the type of work that you can you can do with the management and expectation survey. Um, so this is all from our own work. Um, so first of all, using just the the mess, um we're able to look at changes in the distribution of management practices across types of firms and over time, um, both um, on, in the aggregate, but then also at the linked firm level. Um, with the 2020 wave of the data, we're able to look at the differential response of better and worse managed firms um, to the pandemic in terms of home working rates, online sales, um, and so on, as well as uh, as well as sort of the effects of that on on uh, labor productivity. Then linking linking the mess to other surveys. Um, again, this is from an OLS publication. Um, we're able to bring productivity, firm level productivity, um, to to the table. Um, and finally, um, and finally, this is from our, our most recent piece of work. Uh, we link we link the mess to uh, BIRD, so the the R and D or an SRD survey, and the UK Innovation Survey um, to look at the correlates um, of innovation and and R and D activity. So I think here I'll I'll want to open this up to question, but but just to sum up, the mess I think provides uh, really compelling and interesting firm level evidence on management practices and their determinants, including some that aren't captured elsewhere, um, like certain types of ownership structures, um, of firm expectations at the firm and economy level, and organizational choices that we might expect to be correlated with management practices. And importantly for you as microdata users, um, the mess is linkable both over time across the waves, as well as to other business surveys uh, via the reporting unit reference number. And with that, um, I will stop and open the floor to questions. Thanks very much, Jacob. It's really interesting and, and great to hear more about the survey. So our first question is, can you observe any pattern or bias in the falling response rates in the 2020 data, for example, or i.e. regarding geographical, sectoral, or mm -hmm. characteristics like size? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. And I tried to... Um, Sort of head of that question in my presentation already. So we we can uh, we uh, try to predict response rates based on industry and region fixed effects, um, size of the firm, uh, legal form and turnover, and uh, R squared is really really small. 
Um, for the linked sample, so firms that were sampled both in 2017 and in the latest wave, we were even able to look at uh, their management practices score in 2017, um, because we thought perhaps worse managed firms were uh, less likely to, to respond to a survey in the pandemic. Um, and again, we're finding, we're finding uh, no strong evidence of that. And can I ask how well the, the questions in the survey capture management practices? Mm -hmm. did, you, did you test the questions in advance of, of rolling mm -hmm. them out? Yes, so, um, so of course there was, there was cognitive testing, um, but more importantly, uh, the questions in the MES uh, have been used in, in a, a very similar format by Bloom and Van Rien and in other settings, um, including the US. Um, and we know um, both for the UK and for other countries that they correlate well with, um, with uh, other measures of firm performance. So I, I think um, that they, they, they are a good match, although of course, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always important to take a critical look at your questions yeah. um, and, and see whether they need updating. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and a question around what do you mean by organizational, organizational choice here? <laughs> yeah, so um, to give you a couple of examples, um, particularly with the pandemic, we were, we were interested in how organizations adapt uh, and so included new questions that weren't included in the last wave uh, around um, ad the, the adaptation of homeworking, the switch to online sales, um, supply chain disruptions, um, which, which uh, as far as I know, are not, are not uh, captured elsewhere in ONS business service. Great, thank you. So, except for the big side, I, I guess. Okay, and then one final survey. Is this in this survey? Is there anything collected <laughs> to know about business owners and managers in terms of their personal characteristics, such as ethnicity, mm -hmm. education, experience of running businesses, um, etc.? Mm -hmm. um, no, so I think that's. That's potentially a bit of a blind spot. We do collect some information on the managers. In particular, we, we ask firms about the share of managers that have a degree. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, potentially, this survey is linkable to other data sources, such as companies house data, where um, if, if desired, somebody could bring in some ownership characteristics, but, uh, yeah. but they're, not, they're not in the survey. Yeah. That's a really good suggestion, isn't it, in terms of being able to bring in the external data. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I think that brings us to the end then of, of, of that presentation. So thanks very much, Jakob. It's very interesting. Okay. And thanks to the audience for your questions too. And then we have okay. our, our final um, update on economic microdata research. I'm very pleased to introduce Tom Wickersham. Tom leads the economic microdata research team at the ONS. The team specializes in developing linked firm level data sets to improve national accounts estimates and for research into business economic performance, such as productivity, business dynamism and innovation. Before joining the ONS, Tom worked in various, various economist roles in the National Infrastructure Commission and Her Majesty's Treasury. So I hand over to you now, Tom. Thank you very much. Okay, yes, as introduced, I'm one of the leads of the Economic Microdata Research Team here at the Office of National Statistics. Um, so today I'm going to speak about the work that my team have been doing and work that we have in development. Um, this is a bit broader than some of the previous items on specific surveys, so do forgive me if some of it's a bit high level, but I'm happy to sort of discuss more detail in the Q&A afterwards. So just to tell you a little bit about my team. Um, our research is quite varied, but a common theme is that we specialize in developing linked data sets um, and typically at the firm level. And then we use these data sets for analysis. Um, so we publish original research ourselves through the ONS website and through the Economic Statistics Center of Excellence. And then we also um, often deposit those linked data sets on the secure research service for external researchers to use. So just to give a few examples of the kind of research that we've produced over the past couple of years. Um, the chart on the left, this is from a piece we had uh, of analysis showing how business dynamism has declined since the turn of the millennium, with lower job disruption rates helping to explain employment growth over that period. 
Um, on the right, we've got a chart uh, from a piece we did on firm level labor productivity, and that's using the annual business survey microdata. Um, and it showed widening dispersion of firm level productivity over the past couple of decades. And preparing this presentation made me realize how much of my team's research is summarized in density charts. Um, the piece that the, the chart on the left was something we published via the Economic Stats Center of Excellence. Um, and it used this one used expenditure data from value added tax administrative data, uh, looking at how the ratio between turnover and expenditure for firms changed during the pandemic, which uh, we concluded might weaken the assumption that is often used that turnover from the VAT data can be used as a leading indicator of gross value added um, in national accounts estimation. So that's something where we're doing a bit further work now to, to, to look into that more. And then finally on the right, um, we, uh, we published a piece showing linked administrative trading goods data um, to show how different types of trading firms were more productive on average with firms that didn't trade being less productive. So a bit of a, just to give a taste of the sort of variety of work there. I mean, the other the other major piece of work which sits in our team is the Management and Expectation Survey, which Jakob has just presented on. And I explained that some of our data sets we deposit on the Secure Research Service. A couple of examples of those are the Management and Expectation Survey data, um, linked trading goods with interdepartmental business register, and foreign direct investment, which um, has which is basically just a marker uh, for business units um, of FDI activity that can be linked to the IDBR. I thought it'd be worth highlighting a couple of challenges that we tend to face with all this work. Um, the first is where we're using administrative data. So any of you that use administrative data will be well aware that it's not designed for statistical use um, and that leads to plenty of challenges so that includes getting access to it in the first place cleaning it developing the methodology for linking um, linking that administrative data to the units that we would typically use for business microdata for analysis such as reporting units and local units and then finally once we've done all that cleaning and linking uh, understanding how and why what we see in the administrative data might differ to other sources that we use um, so that's one sort of major area of challenge. I mean, another one, you know, is, is common really uh, is that we're quite a small team and we need to have this balance between updating some of our past data sets with um, you know, more recent data, but also we want to produce new research and data and, and methodology improvements. Um, so we have to sort of trade those things off a bit. So just talk a bit about our, our ongoing and future work. Um, go through a, a few projects that we've got in the pipeline. The first I wanted to mention is the Annual Respondents Database, or ARDX, which is a data set of longitudinal business microdata. So this unites the annual business survey data, which I think is from 2008 to the present day, with its predecessor survey, the annual business inquiry um, from 1994. Um, and an old version of this data set I think already exists on the Secure Research Service, but we want to do various updates to improve it, including bug fixes, an improved conversion between the different generations of industry classifications, better documentation for users, and an updated code for generating firm level capital stocks from this data. And we're aiming to get the updated version of this onto the Secure Research Service by January 2022, so over the next few months. We also have some plans for further productivity microdata research. Um, so the first thing we'd like to do is to update that firm level productivity publication using the latest annual business survey from 2019 and alongside it to update the how productive is your business interactive tool in which businesses can plug in their turnover, intermediate consumption and employment to see where they sit in the productivity distribution for their industry. And that's something we've had some requests to update. We'd also like to do further research into firm level capital stocks estimates and firm level multi-factor productivity. Um, this will be a bit of longer term work as it's, uh, it's sort of treading new ground, I think, using the kind of data that we have available. We also will continue to contribute to OECD business microdata projects. So, for example, Multiprod is one of these projects which produces internationally comparable firm level productivity measures. Um, and the OECD researchers use that to um, 
publish new research. We're also going to co-author a user guide for productivity microdata with the ONS productivity team. And the aim of that will be to make it easier for analysts who aren't, aren't familiar with business microdata to get started in accessing it and using it for productivity analysis. The next project I wanted to mention was the Longitudinal Business Database. So the research that I mentioned earlier on business dynamism was based on an early version of this data set. Uh, the database takes quarterly snapshots of the interdepartmental business register and uses them to construct a linked longitudinal spine, if you like, with a near population coverage of UK businesses. And what this spine does is it allows, um, it's, it, it's a spine of linked business references, uh, which will then allow other longitudinal business data to be linked onto it. And the expectation is that this database will make it much easier to track active businesses over time in the business data to study things like business dynamism um, and restructuring, so things like mergers and acquisitions, and to study how a firm's productivity varies over its life cycle if we are able to link on the productivity microdata to, these, um, to this longitudinal business database spine. Um, so we'll use the spine within the ONS to create these data sets, which can then be deposited onto the secure research service. Um, and we also want to update then our previous research on business dynamism. Just finally then, um, I wanted to offer a few thoughts on um, microdata congruence and how it affects the future of firm level data. So actually a big area that our, our team is working on is um, on linking administrative data sources, particularly tax, so things like corporation tax, VAT data, and company balance sheet data from sources such as Companies House, to the more traditional business surveys, such as the annual business survey. And the initial aim of this work is to actually improve the national accounts by comparing the information from the administrative data about things like turnover, expenditure and profits to our standard survey inputs for the national accounts and identifying areas where the data sources are agree or are congruent or where they might disagree. Uh, so, for example, the administrative data might suggest that a survey measure used to estimate GDP on the production approach is overestimating the rate of growth for a particular industry. And then we could recommend an adjustment to how we balance the different measures of GDP uh, for a more accurate estimate. Couple of minutes. But in the, that's Let's fine. Know, yeah, Thank you. Um, so the national accounts is the, the primary customer for this work, but longer term, this could transform our firm level data too. Um, if we've got administrative data rather than business survey data, it could result in much more comprehensive longitudinal business data. So particularly for the majority of small and medium sized firms that wouldn't be uh, routinely captured every year in the sampled business surveys. Um, the big caveat here is there's lots of further work to do on accessing the data, developing it, all the things I mentioned earlier around the challenges of admin data work. So this is likely to remain within the ONS for the foreseeable future, uh, but I think there's really big longer term potential here. And that was it. That was, uh, um, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions or uh, my email address is there if anyone wants to contact me afterwards about our microdata work. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Tom. It's really, really great to hear. And I know particularly the, the RDEX update sounds very exciting. I know business data users will particularly welcome that. Um, there are some questions, so I'll just go through them then. So the first one actually is around the RDEX. So what period is the updated RDEX coming out in January 22 will be covering? So sorry, which period will it be covering? Um, so I I think if I remember correctly, it will go, it will cover 1994, which I think is what the annual business inquiry data that we have goes back to, um, up to, um, it'll either be 2018 or 2019. We haven't had a chance yet to properly look into the 2019 annual business survey microdata. Um, and I know there were some issues uh, around kind of responses, response rates and things. So we'll need to, to quality check that before we um, put it out, uh, put out the microdata, but hopefully that's what we'll update it to. Great, thanks, Tom. And when do you expect to publish the productivity microdata user guide? Is this something in the pipeline for this year? Uh, again, yeah, I think that's something. It's probably over the next few months. I imagine we'll do an initial version and then you know add to it based on feedback from users. Um, so 
I perhaps wouldn't hold us to the end of this year uh, because it, we probably need to, to 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 sort of plan some of the detail a bit, but um, certainly over the next few months again. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, and a question around whether the the longitudinal database is available on the SRS. Yeah, so as I was trying to explain, um, the 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 spine, if you like, that has all the kind of connected references will probably, at least for the time being, have to stay within the ONS because it will contain, um, I, I, it'll probably be contained, um, it'll be difficult to publish with some like disclosive information. Um, but what we'll aim to do then is use that to construct various linked data sets that would be of interest to microdata users that we could then deposit onto the secure research service. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we'll aim to do that probably like in the first half of next year to start having some data from that available to users. Uh, we're still kind of working on the engineering, if you like, of the, the various linking that's that needs to happen for that to be produced. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, and a question around what is the scope or limitation to linking productivity microdata with R&D data in BIRD? Um, difficult to say without understanding a little bit more of the context of what the research question is. I mean, I think just in terms of the practicalities, so far as I know, it's possible to do using the kind of standard, you know, business reporting units and things. Um, and I'm pretty sure because, I mean, as Jakob mentioned, um, we published some research recently uh, that linked management practices to innovation practices and that involved linking the management expectation survey to data from BIRD, the research and development survey. So um, it's definitely possible and we've produced research using the results um, and uh, you know I'm sure if, if um, they want to get in touch we could provide a bit more information on how to do that. Yeah that's great thank you Tom. Yeah so to, to Mehmet if you wanted to then we can follow that up with, with Tom afterwards. Um, and then a question, to what extent is sector-based productivity analysis viable in the productivity microdata? Um, again, it's not quite clear what they mean by viable, but um, there's all, you know, the, the, the productivity microdata has um, all the different reporting units classified by their um, SIT code for industry classifications. Um, and, you know, as I kind of explained, one of the kind of actual, one of the sort of big challenges in putting together that longitudinal business microdata is to do the conversions between the various generations of industrial classification. So it's definitely possible. And in fact, it's, you know, it's sort of a big area that, you know, a major area that we would usually um, publish our research, you know, along those, that kind of, that split of different industries. Um, so it should definitely be feasible. Yeah, and I guess that's the great thing with all the business data, having the, the standard industrial classification codes in such detailed form, um, it does enable the analysis at, at, at those, those quite detailed levels. So I think that brings us to the, the end of our questions then, Tom. So thank you again. It's a really interesting presentation. And, and thanks again to the audience for, for your questions. OK, it's one o'clock, so um, welcome back, everyone. I think there's people still trickling, but we'll start the panel because because we only have half an hour. So I want to welcome Nick O'Donnell, Francis Potier, and Grant Fitzner, who are going to um, do a Q&A session on, uh, from research and ideas to evidence um, based on the use of economic and business data. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and Nick is going to be asking them some questions. And we'll have a short amount of time, probably a bit less than 10 minutes for questions at the end. Again, if you have any additional questions um, that you want answered later, just pop them in the chat and we will try and formulate a response to that. So I'm going to hand over to Nick uh, and, and he will get the panel started. Thank you very much, Louise, and, and thank you to everybody for attending this session. I, I do appreciate we're competing with both lunch and a nice sunny day. In fact, some people are doing both. But uh, so uh, thank you very much and a really interesting morning. So uh, hopefully we'll have the same this afternoon. So my name is Nick O'Donnell. I'm Head of Engagement, Impact and Insight for the ONS Secure Research Service and very recently the Integrated Data Service. Um, I'm very pleased to have two fantastic uh, panel members today, both of whom have got longer job titles than me. Um, so we've got Francis Potier from uh, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and 
uh, Francis is head of business st uh, statistics, uh, data uh, in the data uh, analytics and business uh, stats division. And then we've also have got Grant Fitzner, who is the chief economist and director of macroeconomic statistics and analysis in the economic, social and environment group in ONS. And I'll hand over to both them. Um, Let's first Francis and then Grant to briefly introduce themselves. Hi everybody, um, so I'm Francis Potter here and as Nick says I'm Head of Business Statistics in Bayes. Um, my team produces uh, four monthly annual and one biannual, biennial, um, official and national statistics releases related to business um, and we also provide some data into the Secure Research Service and the UK Data Service from that. Um, we also support the use of business data across the department, most noticeably the Interdepartmental Business Register, but also just general research, business data use, anything, anything that BASE needs. Hi, uh, and I'm Grant. Thank you, Francis. And, and Grant, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, Grant Fitzner, Chief Economist and Director of Macro Statistics. I'm one of four directors in the uh, recently announced Economic, Social and Environmental Group in ONS, which accounts for um, pretty much everything except census, population statistics and migration um, at the ONS, so about 80 to 90 percent of what you see on our website. Thank you very much, Grant. And so I'm, um, I'm going to start with um, questions. I've got three questions for, for initially Francis, and then I'll move on to Grant. And then there's time, as Louise said, for uh, questions from the audience to ask. So please do uh, record those in the in the chat, and then we'll uh, work through those um, following the initial round of questions. For, also, just before I, I uh, ask Francis, I also wanted to just uh, say the, uh, the theme of this session is really one that's very close to my heart. We do an awful lot of work with researchers and policymakers, data owners, in terms of really trying to showcase the value of the research that takes place and, and how it informs and provides the evidence for policymaking service delivery, improve understanding of the economy and society. So um, something that I think is really important to make sure that we really realize the, the benefits of the, the fantastic research that takes place. So. Um, with that engagement and perhaps in mind for the research community, my first question for Francis is, how does Bayes currently engage with the research community, please? Thanks, Nick. Um, so we have a, a range of ways in which we engage with the research community. Uh, uh, the first and probably the most substantial is that we directly procure a lot of research ourselves. Um, so the latest figure I could find was over £15 million a year on external research. Now, that's not just business. That also is the energy and climate change and labour market elements of the department. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot of different projects, um, and that covers just a wide range of things, um, large-scale regular surveys. So my team, for example, procures a longitudinal small business survey every year, um, but also small-scale qualitative work, one-off surveys, literature reviews, just a whole range of stuff. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it. Uh, and that's, that's through a lot of different elements of researchers, so it'd be academic researchers, it might be some of the big research uh, organisations, or it might be companies that provide sort of data collection services. Um, we're also often approached by researchers directly for, uh, to support their research work. Sometimes that's because it's using data that, that we're providing, again, like the surveys that my, team's, my team runs. Um, it might be because they're looking for some financial report support, um, or it might be that they are looking for support accessing some hard to find data, or just help to get visibility for the research that they're doing, help it get some traction. Um, through Actually through events like this, um, although obviously that was a lot easier when we were all in, in person somewhere, um, but it's, it's quite common for, for base, base analysts in particular or policy people to, to go to a conference or to go to a seminar and get talking to the researchers if, it's, if it looks like it's you know, useful work for base policy development. Um, specific to one of my surveys, the Longitudinal Small Business Survey, we put aside some of the annual budget to fund a handful of small projects every year. So it's usually four to five projects. Um, using the data set and then working with the Enterprise Research Centre, we um, we hold an event to publicise the research that's done and that's part of kind of getting the data out there and making sure that people are using it. Um, and, and the great advantage of the Enterprise Research Centre, apart from the brilliant work they do, is that they can they can host us in the Shard in London, which um, is always a very nice venue, lovely views. 
Um, and then finally, we are also data producers ourselves. Um, so obviously, we talk to people who are using our data, either the publications that we produce or, or using the microdata that we provide to do research themselves. Um, so I will talk to a lot of people, particularly, as I say, for the Longitudinal Small Business Survey, also the UK Innovation Survey, which we manage. Um, and that might be anything from asking questions about the data, um, kind of pitching ideas to us and, and seeing if they can get our support for that. Now, thank you, Francis. You mentioned a couple of data sets there, UKIS and the uh, Longitudinal Small uh, Business Service. Uh, I mean, maybe perhaps you can expand on those and other types of secure data that base you or find particularly. I think Nick's frozen. I think what he was saying is, could you tell us a little bit more about the Innovation Survey and For... Small Business Survey, maybe? Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you. For, I wasn't uh... him or me, which was, which was the problem. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so In I started off the my, team, my team procures the longer research, research and re answering research questions. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry, did you, um, did you hear me? Yeah. Now, I just, just following so, on in terms of. Um, uh, Nick, would you be able to mute yourself so Francis can speak? Is that okay? Because um, we're having problems with your connectivity until the next question. Is that okay? <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. So, yes, yeah, so directly the team manages the, the Longitudinal Small Business Survey and the UK Innovation Survey. Uh, the Longitudinal Small Business Survey is actually a survey of SMEs, most small and medium enterprises. Um, don't blame me for the name. It was named before I was working on it. Um, and that is an annual survey um, which is contracted out. It's a telephone survey. Um, started off as 15,000 businesses. There's been some attrition over the years. We've also had some boosts back up. Um, we, we try and survey the same businesses every year as far as we can with a little bit of top up for um, survey attrition, but also to to make sure that we're still taking on board sort of new businesses um, and it's still representative. Um, and that covers just a range of issues that SMEs might need to deal with business finance, uh, energy, innovation, exporting. Um, it was mentioned this morning, but we have some data on the ethnicity and sex of business owners in there. Um, it's we, we serve sort of uses across government the devolved administrations we put in questions for them and then we make the data available through the secure research service and through the UK data service uh, for researchers to use we also publish uh, results ourselves so uh, last month we published two reports on employing and non-employing businesses off the back of that survey um, and on the 30th of September, we'll be publishing the panel report, which is a specific look at those businesses that responded in each of the last three years. So that's attempting to make some use of the longitudinal element. Um, the other one is the UK Innovation Survey, um, which is carried out every two years. Um, and the data collection is done on basis behalf by the ONS. Um, and that follows the OECD's, I always get this wrong, whichever manual it is that, that does innovation. Um, so it's internationally comparable. Um, and that's collecting information about innovation activity by British business. Um, our, our sample is businesses 10, 10 employees and over. Um, what, what activity they're doing, what are barriers to innovation, what are drivers to innovation, um, the type of people that they employ to do that, that kind of innovative work. Um, the latest survey is in the field at the moment, was well, started in February and will go on for another month or so. Um, we expect to publish the first reports of that one in be sometime, probably spring next year. Um, details still to be decided because up until now we've been them. Um, our, our timetable has been decided by Eurostat on our behalf, and obviously we're not quite so uh, so beholden to that anymore. So those are the two. Those are the two data sets that we manage. Otherwise, we make a lot of use of the interdepartmental business register. Um, which is also available as the business structure database through the data services. Um, we hold extracts within Bayes. We, we use it for all the survey work. So both the surveys I've previously mentioned are sampled through it um, because it's useful for us to be able to use the same survey register as, as ONS is using for their surveys. Um, we are able to share it with ONS permission with contractors for carrying out surveys. Um, but we also use it for analysis for things like identifying control groups if you're if you're trying to evaluate the impact of an intervention it's useful to be able to identify a control group for that sort of thing 
and also cluster analysis. So when the industrial strategy was published in 2017, we published some cluster analysis based on um, the, the geographic information in the IDBR. Um, and finally, we, we make use also of microdata, all the other ONS business microdata, um, annual business survey, annual purchase survey, um, business enterprise, R&D, all of them. Um, we're, we're very interested, obviously, in R&D innovation as part of the department's policy objectives. Um, but we're also looking at supply chains, we're looking at energy consumption, uh, we're looking at domestic production, comparing it to um, trade data, and we're very interested in productivity as well. Thank you, Francis. Hopefully, can you hear me now? Can you yes, hear me okay? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very comprehensive and really interesting, and the the wide you know use and diversity there from the the of the data. So, final question, really, for me: um, Are there any particular aims or perhaps you know things, areas of research interest that you would like uh, research to answer through the use of business data, please? Yeah. So I, I had to look at our most recently published areas of research interest document um, to make sure I have broad coverage for this. Uh, we published it in February 2020, um, which was obviously excellent timing and everything that's happened since then. Uh, but it is it is uh, interesting, it's still very still very relevant. Um, so we're very interested in, it's been mentioned before this morning, that the levelling up agenda, uh, we've always been interested in uh, elements of sort of place-based analysis relating to business, uh, clusters, agglomeration. So anything relating to those areas we're interested in. Uh, we're interested in supply chain, particularly sort of bottlenecks and vulnerabilities, which has obviously become an even greater thing over the last year, 18 months or so. Um, we're interested in R&D, how you turn innovation R&D into sort of business growth and, and business success. Um, and we're also interested in things like business perception of regulation, um, what they think of, what businesses think of the policies that we're, that we're putting out and how successful they are. Uh, thank you, Francis. That was that was really informative. And uh, again, you know, I, I, I've been scribbling everything down there because, um, as colleagues on the call, on the call who uh, manage our impact insight work, you know, it's, it's it's so valuable for us to to understand how it's uh, how the data, how that research subsequently uh, translates into uh, policy or, or service delivery. So, um, perhaps if I if I can move on, that's move on to Grant. And thank you, Francis. Um, in terms, of, I can ask the same question of Grant. So. Are, are there any particular aims that, that you would like research to to help answer through the through the use of business data? Um, well, many. How long have you got, Nick? You know, um, let me run through a list of the kind of things we're working on, we're currently doing, or we plan to work on, or we would love to engage with uh, colleagues on the call on. Um, I, th I think the starting point, though, is, is uh, as with the Department of Business and other parts of government, obviously um, we're looking to be aligned with the government's top priorities. And in case you're wondering what those are at the moment, um, you may have heard that net zero and levelling up uh, are the top two priorities, and certainly we're doing work uh, on both of those areas in terms of subnational data statistics analysis and net zero and broader environmental issues. Um, on so-called Global Britain, um, we're certainly doing some work on trade and we will be looking to do more. And then there's a whole issue around recovery from the current pandemic and recession and the impact that that has had or will have as well. And I'd say there's a particular focus at the moment on subnational research and analysis. Um, there'll be a white paper published by the Cabinet Office uh, later this year around the time of the budget. Um, shortly after that, we're expecting to publish a subnational data and statistics strategy which was kind of set out based both what we're doing at the ONS and across government in this space but also what our ambition is to do in the future and that will I'm sure include a lot more granular local and regional data hopefully available in flexible geographies um, and a lot more research and analysis in this field uh, because we certainly we want to better understand what the drivers of local and regional job skills and prosperity are. Um, in addition to that uh, some of you, particularly those who are familiar with their work on es with ESCO, uh, will be aware that the ONS has been one of the leading national statistical institutes doing so-called beyond GDP work. 
uh, moving beyond the current systems of national accounts. So that includes quite a lot of work around natural capital, human capital, intangible investments, environmental assets, digitalization, etc. Um, I will put a link in the comments to one or two discussion papers that we published, which give you a broader sense of that. But that's quite a broad agenda. A lot of that is new work. Uh, we welcome engagement with uh, academic researchers on, on those. Now, in addition to those, uh, I wouldn't be a director of macroeconomic analysis without talking about some of the more traditional macro themes. So uh, we're really interested and we'll be doing more work on economic scarring and the extent to which, for example, government support through the pandemic may have mitigated the extent of corporate failure. Uh, we're also relating to that um, the extent of structural transformation in the economy. Uh, that we are likely to see as a result of the pandemic and the recession. Now, of course, um, some of those questions we would need to wait a year or two until we have more up-to-date data before we can really start to, to um, analyse those. But nonetheless, those are kind of medium-term research questions where I think um, th there's a lot of opportunity to do some really interesting work. Relating to that, uh, understanding the long-term impact of EU exit, uh, we're seeing major changes in global supply chains and supply chain uh, constraints. There's lots of talk that people will be diversifying their uh, suppliers. There'll be relocalization, less use of just-in-time, etc. cetera. Um, of course, it's hard to unpack the effects of leaving the EU from the effects of the pandemic and the recession um, because they all happen broadly concurrently, but certainly that's an area we'll be doing more research on over the coming years. Uh, and just to pick one or two other things up, I think there's always room to do more on industry and business dynamics. And for those of you who saw uh, uh, Thomas Wickersham's run through, things like the longitudinal business uh, data set, et cetera, and the AR, ARDX, I think would give us uh, really good tools to really be able to answer some of those questions in more ways. Um, also, I think a bit more work around industry concentration, an area we haven't done as much work on in the UK as so in the US, but I think there's real potential there. And then finally, because I know this has been quite a long answer, um, we're increasingly publishing real-time indicators. A lot of those are not currently available in the SRS, but we will be looking where we can to include them and to link them to other data sources. And we're really keen uh, at some point to be able to share things like the retail scanner data, that we're now receiving from a number of major retailers, obviously in an anonymized um, form, and potentially even other other data sources, um, such as the HMRC pay as you earn data, uh, that may be at a relatively aggregated level initially, but certainly just opening up all those high frequency and real time uh, data sources where we can. And I'd also point out there is some interesting da data already that we publish every Thursday morning, including things like uh, traffic camera, and flight information as well. So there is some, a lot of it is not necessarily ideally suited to academic research, um, unless you want to use it for things like now casting models. Um, but nonetheless, that's an area that we plan to, to grow as well and to make available where we can for research. No, thank you, Craig. That was incredibly comprehensive. Re really interesting. Uh, um, I mean, one of my own observations from the research in the Secure Research Service is how few sort of climate sustainability projects have taken place. So, you know, it's really exciting. Hopefully, you know, to see the drive towards that and uh, see if, you know, we start to see a lot more research based on, you know, the data being made available. So um, my second question is sort of diverting a little bit away from the, the mainstream. So ONS has, has just uh, received, gained research organization status with the uh, UK Research and Innovation. So um, could you say a little bit more about the opportunities for collaboration you think this might bring? Um, well, I don't think we've really thought through what the implications are, but do, let me just give you a practical example. Um, recently, the, the ESRC awarded a reasonable chunk of money to work on productivity and it saw the establishment of the Productivity Institute uh, at Manchester University. Um, we had extensive discussions with the consortium ahead of the, that bid going in, but we weren't able to join as an equal partner in that consortium or as kind of the, the poor cousin in, in the sense that we would supply a lot of the data, but we wouldn't actually be a research partner. Um, I think this puts us more on a more equal footing. It means that we could not only join consortiums, but potentially lead bids um, for research funding. Uh, and I think that just gives us a lot more opportunity to, to partake of the wide range of researchers out there. Um, 
But I think it's going to be a bit of a slow burn. I think first we need to identify what areas we think there are gaps or opportunities and, and really just start to engage with people and talk through what's possible. Um, we won't be able to do everything, but I, I do think that that would see us involved more actively in, in a wider range of research than we currently are. Thank you, Grant. And staying with the theme of engagement, what avenues do ONS offer for engagement with economists and researchers using ONS business data? Um, well, I saw that Francis talked about um, the areas of research interest. Unusually, ONS haven't published anything of that nature um, for a while now, which, which doesn't help, although you only have to look at our website to kind of see what sort of areas of research we are interested in. Uh, we, following the, the public sector research establishment status, we are working on a, a fairly comprehensive research plan, and I'm hoping we'll also publish an areas of research interest on gov.uk in the next three to six months. Um, my starting point, if I was a researcher, would be to have a look at that when it comes out and then have a conversation with us if there's something in there that you would like to work with us on. In the meantime, um, we are working closely with a number of research partners. The Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence, ESCO, has a broad range, I think about 20 projects at the moment that we're working with academics across the UK and internationally on. Um, if you have a look at their website, that will give you a good sense of what we're doing there. We are doing three projects in partnership with the Turing Institute. We're also working with the Cardiff Research Partnership. Um, and of course, we engage with researchers through the SRS and, and other forums. But I mean, my key piece of advice there is, look, if you have an interesting research idea or you see something on our website that, that kind of touches on an area you're working on, and I think uh, my colleagues have run through quite a number of areas uh, this morning that, that I think people may find of interest, drop us an email, come and talk to us, um, tell us what your research idea is. I mean, one of the things that, that's kind of surprised me in the three years I've been at the ONS is I would get maybe one or two academics a year coming to me by email or in person or over the phone and saying, I've got this really good research idea, but I can't get the data or I'd like to work with you on X. Um, it happens a lot less than I would have expected given the huge amount of data that we're sitting on and which is only going to grow uh, in the future. So I think there are some missed opportunities. Let's have a conversation. Tell us what you, you're planning to do and if we can make it work and we see value in it, then then let's get on with it. No, thank you, thank you, Grant. I think that I, I totally agree with you know the point there. I mean, we each of the events that we run, you know, like the research capability event that we're running in a, in a few weeks' time, the very much focus has been on that engagement right across the research community and the collaboration and by joining up together and sharing insights, sharing ideas, innovative messages, uh, methods, sorry, you know, that's very much where we can, you know, collectively we can be more effective and, uh, share, you know, share, sharing our understanding and our knowledge. So, uh, yeah, very much agree with that. Um, Thank you both for answering all my questions. So I'm going to open it up to the, um, the floor if anybody else would like to ask a question from uh, either or both of our, uh, our panelists. And please do um, write something in the chat and I'll, uh, we'll, we'll follow up. Um, I can see a question from Brian. So does the, I think this perhaps is asked for both, does ONS have a directory that academics can access? As an academic, I don't know who to approach. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that directory might be, but if that would chime with you, Grant. Well, we publish sure thousands, quite what the directory is. <laughs> we publish thousands of bulletins and research and articles every year. Uh, and as I said, you know, if you look at what we publish on business dynamism, on trade, on productivity, etc., um, everything we publish has contact details on it. So, yeah, if you if you want to talk about productivity, talk to our head of productivity. Um, if you want to talk about some of the work we've done in the industry, but business dynamism, um, look at the latest article we published on that and, and get in touch with the authors. You know, we're, we're open, we're accessible. Um, we could publish a list of who the contacts are for each particular area of what we do, but A, that would be a very long list, um, and B, it would very quickly get out of date, I suspect. Grant, I just wanted to add in there that I know that there's a guide coming for working with academics as part of the, the research strategy that's being written now. I'm not sure when it's coming out, but I think that will be a very, very good port of call for, for academics to go to first. 
Yeah, and, and I think it, for, for want of clarity, people should assume that almost everything uh, relating to uh, business and economic statistics uh, and research were involved in one way or another. There's almost invariably somebody in the organisation who is the authority on a particular area. Um, if you have trouble reaching them, find out who that is, just ping me an email and I'll forward it on to the relevant colleague. So I can um, ask for if um, Francis has a view. So the question that's been asked by Sakarius is, it would be great if government departments published an end of year review of those areas of research interests with links to relevant published work or a note on which projects are in progress. I mean, I think that's probably something where we, ONS could work together with the uh, Bayes and other uh, organisations, because obviously we a lot of that research takes place in the SRS. So if there's anything else you want to add, um, Francis? I mean, so uh, the, the area of research interest document does have some links to uh, research that was, I think, most in most cases complete and have been published um, in areas relating to, to other elements in that document. Um, and, you know, we, we also publish, we publish all the statistics, all the statistics and most of the research that, uh, that we've carried out as well. Um, I, not really in quite so organised a fashion as, as I think Keris is suggesting. Um, but certainly the areas of research interest is a, is a good starting point. Um, and also the sort of research and transparency areas of our website. Francis. Uh, the next just, uh, just, uh, just one more question and then, and then we need to wrap up for the, um, the breakouts. But one more question is brilliant. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And the question is from, uh, I think, Tian Chu, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, the question is, there are quite a number of data and some of them are overlapping with each other. In addition, there are so many documents for each. For a new user, these information sometimes appears to be confusing. For example, the business expenditure on research and development stroke innovation survey. So um, I don't know if there's anything either of you can add on those, but I think part of the answer there, I'm sure, is the, the data catalog that we're developing, for instance, for the Secure Research Service, which will provide a lot more comprehensive metadata and uh, helpfully guide researchers to what the how the data can be used with, with some you know examples of uh, where those data sets are used that we can provide from existing projects but perhaps if there's anything else briefly that Grant or Francis might want to add on that. Uh, so I have I have one thing which is my my team publishes something called business population estimates uh, which overlaps quite a lot with a couple of ONS releases the, the business demography and the UK business activity size and location. Um, so one thing we've done Bayes working with ONS is to publish a document that says which, which one you would want to use for which purpose. Um, so I think I think that and that kind of thing is, is quite useful. We also try in the innovation server, and I think the bird team do as well, to, to refer to each other's releases in our release um, and, and why you might want to when you might want to use our release and when you might want to use you know, the other one. So I think that's 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 quite a useful way of going about it. Um, and most stats releases these days, ONS and, and other departments will have some part section of it that is sort of um, associated information or, or other information on this topic. Yeah, and, and just a tip from me in terms of finding the right person or the right piece of, right piece of research or article on a topic. Um, the search engine on the ONS website is not great. So just go to Google, key ONS and whatever topic it is, and you'll, you'll find probably the most recent article on that, and from that you'll be able to work out who you need to speak to. I'd, I'd agree with that for the gov.uk website as well. Google's have often a more <laughs> success, successful search engine to use. Uh, well, th thank you very much, Francis and Grant. It's been a fascinating session. I I've learned an awful lot, and uh, I've been knowing this a few years, but uh, it's been really informative. So, so thank you both, and uh, thanks for your time and contribution. Brilliant. Thank you. thank you, Nick, and thank you, Francis and Grant. It's thank really you. interesting. I, I think for some of the questions that haven't been answered, we'll provide responses afterwards. But thank you so much. So hi, everyone. Welcome back. So Louise and I just wanted to say a few final words to bring the conference to a close. And I just wanted to make three short points, because I'm sure you've all got other things to be doing. Um, so my first point is to say that we are so lucky in the UK to have access to these incredible data sets that the ONS presentations have highlight highlighted. And without access to these data via the Secure Research Service and Secure Lab, 
then it would be much more difficult for researchers. So a huge um, thank you to people who work within those two services to provide these data. Second thing I wanted to say is that the aim of these user conferences is to provide a forum for that vital link between researchers and data producers such as ONS. And that has definitely been achieved today. It's been evidenced by the really lively Q&A sessions. So it's been, I think it's been a brilliant day. And then my third point is to say some big thank yous to everyone. So thank you very much to all the presenters who've given their time and all the chairs as well. It's been a lot of background preparation for the presenters and chairs. And to everybody here as attendees for creating such interesting and lively discussions around the presentation topics. You've all been really good. So thank you again to our colleagues who work in Secure Lab and Secure Research Service for their hard work throughout the year. And then very finally, an enormous thank you to my colleagues Jill Meadows and Saoirse O'Callaghan from the UK Data Service who work tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure the admin and the logistics of these conferences run so smoothly. And they organise so many of these important events, not just this one, for the research community. So a huge thank you to both of them for the work that they do. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Louise just to say a few words too. Thank you, Vanessa. I just want to echo, it's been a really brilliant day, fascinating. I think I've learned something, we've all learned something. And thank you all for sticking to time and following the rules and um, adding quest the word question when you're asked to do questions. So it, I think it's been really nice and it just shows how these virtual conferences can bring so many so many really skilled people together. Just very quickly, if you have any additional questions for the ONS teams, please route them to my email address on there. That's the development impact, and we'll route them through to the people. And we want to try and answer some of the questions probably in a follow-up blog that, that will be coming out, and we'll be posting that on the on the UK Data Service. And we may have an FAQ on there, Vanessa, as well, uh, together with the presentations. Um, the other thing is both of our teams, Vanessa's, Vanessa's um, UK Data Service and, and um, the SRS, we both have impact teams that do work and um, to try and work with researchers to accelerate their impact through case studies, through knowledge exchange events like this. Please let us know if you'd like your impact accelerated or feel that you have produced something where you'd like us to help with just dis dissemination. So that's just an open invitation to get in touch with us. But otherwise, thank you so much for attending. And thank you, Vanessa and team, for doing such brilliant organisation as well.